Alnwick Castle from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Home of the Percy's high born race, home of their beautiful and brave, alike their birth and burial place, their cradle and their grave. Still sternly o'er the castle gate, their house's lion stands in state as in his proud departed hours and warriors frown in stone on high and feudal banners flout the sky above his princely towers a gentle hill its side inclines lovely in england's fadeless green to meet the quiet stream which winds through this romantic scene as silently and sweetly still as when at evening on that hill while summer's wind blew soft and low seated by gallant hotspur's side his catherine was a happy bride a thousand years ago gaze on the abbey's ruined pile does not the succouring ivy keeping her watch around it seem to smile as o'er a loved one sleeping one solitary turret grey still tells in melancholy glory the legend of the cheviot day the purse's proudest border story that day its roof was triumph's arch then rang from aisle to pictured dome the light step of the soldier's march the music of the trump and drum and babe and sire the old the young and the monk's hymn and minstrel's song and woman's pure kiss sweet and long welcomed her warrior home wild roses by the abbey towers are gay in their young bud and bloom they were born of a race of funeral flowers that garlanded in long gone hours the templar's knightly tomb he died the sword in his mailed hand on the holiest spot of the blessed land where the cross was damped with his dying breath when blood ran free as festal wine and the sainted air of palestine was thick with the darts of death wise with the lore of centuries what tales if there be tongues in trees those giant oaks could tell of beings born and buried here tales of the peasant and the peer tales of the bridal and the beer the welcome and farewell since on their boughs the startled bird first in her twilight slumbers heard the norman's curfew bell i wandered through the lofty halls trod by the purses of old fame and traced upon the chapel walls each high heroic name from him who once his standard set where now o'er mosque and minaret glitter the sultan's crescent moons to him who when a younger son fought for king george at lexington a major of dragoons that last half stanza it has dashed from my warm lip the sparkling cup the light that o'er my eye-beam flashed the power that bore my spirit up above this banknote world is gone and alnwick's but a market town and this alas its market day and beasts and borderers throng the way oxen and bleating lambs in lot northumbrian boars and plaided scots men in the coal and cattle line from teviot's bard and hero land from royal berwick's beach of sand from wooler morpeth hexham and newcastle upon tyne these are not the romantic times so beautiful in spenser's rhymes so dazzling to the dreaming boy ours are the days of fact not fable of knights but not of the round table of bailey jarvey not rob roy tis what our president munro has called the era of good feeling 
the highlander the bitterest foe to modern laws has felt their blow consented to be taxed and vote and put on pantaloons and coat and leave off cattle stealing lord stafford mines for coal and salt the duke of norfolk deals in malt the douglas in red herrings and noble name and cultured land palace and park and vassal band are powerless to the notes of hand of rothschild or the bearings the age of bargaining said burke has come to-day the turban turk sleep richard of the lion heart sleep on nor from your cerement start is england's friend and fast ally the moslem tramples on the greek and on the cross and altar stone and christendom looks tamely on and hears the christian maiden shriek and sees the christian father die and not a sabre blow is given for greece and fame for faith and heaven by europe's craven chivalry you'll ask if yet the percy lives in the armed pomp of feudal state the present representatives of hotspur and his gentle kate are some half dozen serving men in the drab coat of william penn a chambermaid whose lip and eye and cheek and brown hair bright and curling spoke nature's aristocracy and one half groom half seneschal who bowed me through court bower and hall from donjon keep to turret wall for ten and sixpence sterling end of poem this recording is in the public domain marco bozaris from the poetical works of fitzgreen halleck read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone at midnight in his guarded tent the turk was dreaming of the hour when greece her knee in suppliance bent should tremble at his power in dreams through camp and court he bore the trophies of a conqueror in dreams his song of triumph heard then wore his monarch's signet ring then pressed that monarch's throne a king as wild his thoughts and gay of wing as eden's garden bird at midnight in the forest shades bozaris reigned his suliot band true as the steel of their tried blades heroes in heart and hand there had the persians thousands stood there had the glad earth drunk their blood on old platea's day and now there breathed that haunted air the sons of sires who conquered there with arm to strike and soul to dare as quick as far as they an hour passed on the turk awoke that bright dream was his last he woke to hear his centuries shriek to arms they come the greek the greek he woke to die midst flame and smoke and shout and groan and sabre stroke and death shots falling thick and fast as lightnings from the mountain cloud and heard with voices trumpet loud bozaris cheer his band strike till the last armed foe expires strike for your altars and your fires strike for the green graves of your sires god and your native land they fought like brave men long and well they piled that ground with moslems slain they conquered but bozaris fell bleeding at every vein his few surviving comrades saw his smile when rang their proud hurrah and the red field was won then saw in death his eyelids close calmly as to a night's repose like flowers at set of sun come to the bridal chamber death 
come to the mother's when she feels for the first time her first-born's breath come when the blessed seals that close the pestilence are broke and crowded cities wail its stroke come in consumption's ghastly form the earthquake shock the ocean's storm come when the heart beats high and warm with banquet song and dance and wine and thou art terrible the tear the groan the knell the pall the beer and all we know or dream or fear of agony are thine but to the hero when his sword has won the battle for the free thy voice sounds like a prophet's word and in its hollow tones are heard the thanks of millions yet to be come when his task of fame is wrought come with her laurel leaf blood bought come in her crowning hour and then thy sunken eyes unearthly light to him is welcome as the sight of sky and stars to prisoned men thy grasp is welcome as the hand of brother in a foreign land thy summons welcome as the cry that told the indian isles were nigh to the world-seeking genoese when the land wind from woods of palm and orange groves and fields of balm blew o'er the haitian seas bozomris with the storied brave greece nurtured in her glory's time rest thee there is no prouder grave even in her own proud clime she wore no funeral weeds for thee nor bade the dark hearse wave its plume like torn branch from death's leafless tree in sorrow's pomp and pageantry the heartless luxury of the tomb but she remembers thee as one long loved and for a season gone for thee her poet's lyre is wreathed her marble wrought her music breathed for thee she rings the birthday bells of thee her babe's first lisping tells for thine her evening prayer is said at palace couch and cottage bed her soldier closing with the foe gives for thy sake a deadlier blow his plighted maiden when she fears for him the joy of her young years thinks of thy fate and checks her tears and she the mother of thy boys though in her eye and faded cheek is read the grief she will not speak the memory of her buried joys and even she who gave thee birth will by their pilgrim circled hearth talk of thy doom without a sigh for thou art freedom's now and fame's one of the few the immortal names that were not born to die end of poem this recording is in the public domain burns from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. To a rose brought from near Alloway Kirk in Ayrshire in the autumn of eighteen twenty two. Wild rose of Alloway, my thanks, thou mindest me of that autumn noon, when first we met upon the banks, and braise, O bonny doon. Like thine beneath the thorn tree's bough, my sunny hour was glad and brief. We've crossed the winter sea, and thou art withered, flower and leaf and will not thy death doom be mine the doom of all things wrought of clay and withered my life's leaf like thine wild rose of alloway not so his memory for whose sake my bosom bore thee far and long his who a humbler flower could make immortal as his song 
the memory of burns a name that calls when brimmed her festal cup a nation's glory and her shame in silent sadness up a nation's glory be the rest forgot she's canonized his mind and it is joy to speak the best we may of humankind i've stood beside the cottage bed where the bard present first drew breath a straw thatch roof above his head a straw wrought couch beneath and i have stood beside the pile his monument that tells to heaven the homage of earth's proudest isle to that bard peasant given bid thy thoughts hover o'er that spot boy minstrel in thy dreaming hour and know however low his lot a poet's pride and power the pride that lifted burns from earth the power that gave a child of song ascendancy o'er rank and birth the rich the brave the strong and if despondency weigh down thy spirit's fluttering pinions then despair thy name is written on the roll of common men there have been loftier themes than his and longer scrolls and louder lyres and lays lit up with poesies purer and holier fires yet read the names that know not death few nobler ones than burns are there and few have won a greener wreath than that which binds his hair his is that language of the heart in which the answering heart would speak thought word that bids the warm tear start or the smile light the cheek and his that music to whose tone the common pulse of man keeps time in cot or castle's mirth or moan in cold or sunny clime and who hath heard his song nor knelt before its spell with willing knee and listened and believed and felt the poet's mastery or the mind sea in calm and storm or the heart's sunshine and its showers or passion's moments bright and warm or reason's dark cold hours on fields where brave men die or do in halls where rings the banquet's mirth where mourners weep where lovers woo from throne to cottage hearth what sweet tears dim the eyes unshed what wild vows falter on the tongue when scots we hey we wallace bled or old lang syne is sung pure hopes that lift the soul above come with his cotter's hymn of praise and dreams of youth and truth and love with logan's banks and braes and when he breathes his master lay of alloway's which haunted wall all passions in our frames of clay come thronging at his call imagination's world of air and our own world its gloom and glee wit pathos poetry are there and death's sublimity and burns though brief the race he ran though rough and dark the path he trod lived died in form and soul a man the image of his god through care and pain and want and woe with wounds that only death could heal tortures the poor alone can know the proud alone can feel he kept his honesty and truth his independent tongue and pen and moved in manhood as in youth pride of his fellow-men strong sense deep feeling passions strong a hate of tyrant and of knave a love of right a scorn of wrong of coward and of slave a kind true heart a spirit high that could not fear and would not bow were written in his manly eye and on his manly brow praise to the bard his words are driven 
like flower seeds by the far winds sown where'er beneath the sky of heaven the birds of fame have flown praise to the man a nation stood beside his coffin with wet eyes her brave her beautiful her good as when a loved one dies and still as on his funeral day men stand his cold earth couch around with the mute homage that we pay to consecrated ground and consecrated ground it is the last the hallowed home of one who lives upon all memories though with the buried gone such graves as his are pilgrim shrines shrines to no code or creed confined the delphian vales the palestines the meccas of the mind sages with wisdom's garland wreathed crowned kings and mitred priests of power and warriors with their bright sword sheathed the mightiest of the hour and lowlier names whose humble home is lit by fortune's dimmer star are there or wave and mountain come from countries near and far pilgrims whose wandering feet have pressed the Schweitzer's snow the arab's sand or trod the piled leaves of the west my own green forest land all ask the cottage of his birth gaze on the scenes he loved and sung and gather feelings not of earth his fields and streams among they linger by the dunes low trees and pastoral nith and wooded air and round thy sepulchres dumfries the poet's tomb is there but what to them the sculptor's art his funeral columns wreaths and urns were they not graven on the heart the name of robert burns in the poem this recording is in the public domain wyoming from the poetical works of fitzgreen halleck read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone d'ici la nature n'a pas fait ce beau pays pour un joli pour un clair et pour un saint preux mais ne les y cherchez pas rousseau thou comest in beauty on my gaze at last on susquehanna's side fair wyoming image of many a dream in hours long past when life was in its bud and blossoming and waters gushing from the fountain spring of pure enthusiast thought dimmed my young eyes as by the poet borne on unseen wing i breathed in fancy neath thy cloudless skies the summer's air and heard her echoed harmonies i then but dreamed thou art before me now in life a vision of the brain no more i've stood upon the wooded mountain's brow that beetles high thy lovely valley o'er and now where winds thy river's greenish shore within a bower of sycamores am laid and winds as soft and sweet as ever bore the fragrance of wild flowers through sun and shade are singing in the trees whose low boughs press my head nature hath made thee lovelier than the power even of campbell's pen hath pictured he had woven had he gazed one sunny hour upon thy smiling veil its scenery with more of truth and made each rock and tree known like old friends and greeted from afar and there their tales of sad reality in the dark legends of thy border war with woes of deeper tint than his own gertrude's are but where are they the beings of the mind the bard's creations moulded not of clay hearts to strange bliss and suffering assigned 
young gertrude albert waldegrave where are they we need not ask the people of to-day appear good honest quiet men enough and hospitable too for ready pay with manners like their roads a little rough and hands whose grasp is warm and welcoming though tough judge hallenbach who keeps the toll-bridge gate and the town records is the albert now of wyoming like him in church and state her doric column and upon his brow the thin hairs white with seventy winters snow look patriarchal waldegrave twere in vain to point out here unless in yon scarecrow that stands full uniformed upon the plain to frighten flocks of crows and blackbirds from the grain for he would look particularly droll in his iberian boot and spanish plume and be the wonder of each christian soul as of the birds that scare crow and his broom but gertrude in her loveliness and bloom hath many a model here for woman's eye in court or cottage wheresoe'er her home hath a heart spell too holy and too high to be or praised even by her worshipper poesy there's one in the next field of sweet sixteen singing and summoning thoughts of beauty born in heaven with her jacket of light green love darting eyes and tresses like the morn without a shoe or stocking hoeing corn whether like gertrude she oft wanders there with shakespeare's volume in her bosom born i think is doubtful of the poet player the maiden knows no more than cobbett or voltaire there is a woman widowed grey and old who tells you where the foot of battle stepped upon their day of massacre she told its tale and pointed to the spot and wept whereon her father and five brothers slept shroudless the bright dream slumbers of the brave when all the land a funeral mourning kept and there wild laurels planted on the grave by nature's hand in air their pale red blossoms wave and on the margin of yon orchard hill are marks where time-worn battlements have been and in the tall grass traces linger still of arrowy frieze and wedged ravelin five hundred of her brave that valley green trod on the morn in soldiers spirit gay but twenty lived to tell the noonday scene and where are now the twenty passed away has death no triumph hours save on the battle day end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the death of joseph rodman drake from the poetical works of fitzgreen halleck read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone green be the turf above thee friend of my better days none knew thee but to love thee nor name thee but to praise tears fell when thou wert dying from eyes unused to weep and long where thou art lying will tears the cold turf steep when hearts whose truth was proven like thine are laid in earth there should a wreath be woven to tell the world their worth and i who woke each morrow to clasp thy hand in mine who shared thy joy and sorrow whose weal and woe were thine it should be mine to braid it around thy faded brow but i've in vain essayed it and feel i cannot now while memory bids me weep thee nor thoughts nor words are free the grief is fixed too deeply that mourns a man like thee end of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. Twilight from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee There is an evening twilight of the heart when its wild passion waves are lulled to rest and the eye sees life's fairy scenes depart as fades the daybeam in the rosy west. Tis with a nameless feeling of regret we gaze upon them as they melt away and fondly would we bid them linger yet, but hope is round us with her angel lay. Hailing afar some happier moonlight hour, dear are her whispers still, though lost their early power. In youth the cheek was crimsoned with her glow, her smile was loveliest then. Her matin song was heaven's own music, and the note of woe was all unheard her sunny bowers among. Life's little word of bliss was newly born. We knew not, cared not, it was born to die. Flushed with the cool breeze and the dews of morn, with dancing heart we gazed on the pure sky and mocked the passing clouds that dimmed its blue like our own sorrows then, as fleeting and as few. And manhood felt her sway too, on the eye, half realized her early dreams first bright, her promised bower of happiness seemed nigh, its days of joy, its vigils of delight. And though at times might lower the thunderstorm, and the red lightnings threaten still the air, was balmy with her breath and her loved form, the rainbow of the heart was hovering there. Tis in life's noontide she is nearest seen, her wreath the summer flower, her robe of summer green. But though less dazzling in her twilight dress, there's more of heaven's pure beam about her now, that angel smile of tranquil loveliness, which the heart worships glowing on her brow. That smile shall brighten the dim evening star that points our destined tomb nor ever depart till the faint light of life is fled afar and hushed the last deep beating of the heart the meteor bearer of our parting breath a moonbeam in the midnight cloud of death end of poem this recording is in the public domain Psalm 137 from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson By the Rivers of Babylon We sat us down and wept where Babel's waters slept, And we thought of home and Zion as a long-gone happy dream. We hung our harps in air on the willow boughs, Which there, gloomy as round a sepulchre, were drooping o'er the stream. The foes who chain we wore were with us on that shore, exulting in our tears that told the bitterness of woe. Sing us, they cried aloud, ye once so high and proud, the song she sang in Zion ere we laid her glory low. And shall the harp of heaven to Judah's monarch given be touched by captive fingers or grace a fettered hand? No, sooner be my tongue mute powerless and unstrung then its words of holy music make glad a stranger land may this right hand whose skill can wake the harp at will and bid the listener's joys or griefs in light or darkness come forget its godlike power if for one brief dark hour my heart forgets jerusalem fallen city of my home daughter of babylon Blessed be that chosen one, whom God shall send to smite thee, when there is none to save. He from the mother's breast shall pluck the babe at rest, and lay it in the sleep of death beside its father's grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Unknown from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Matstone. The world is bright before thee, its summer flowers are thine, its calm blue sky is o'er thee, thy bosom pleasures shrine, and thine the sunbeam given to nature's morning hour, pure warm as when from heaven it burst on Eden's bower there is a song of sorrow the death dirge of the gay that tells ere dawn of morrow these charms may melt away that sun's bright beam be shaded that sky be blue no more the summer flowers be faded and youth's warm promise o'er believe it not though lonely thy evening home may be though beauty's bark can only float on a summer sea though time thy bloom is stealing there's still beyond his art the wild flower wreath of feeling the sunbeam of the heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Field of the Grounded Arms From the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Field of the Grounded Arms Saratoga Strangers, your eyes are on that valley fixed Intently, as we gaze on vacancy When the mind's wings overspread The spirit world of dreams True, tis a scene of loveliness The bright green dwelling Of the summer's first-born hours whose wakened leaf and bud are welcoming the morn. And morn returns the welcome, sun and cloud smile on the green earth from their home in heaven, even as a mother smiles above her cradled boy, and wreathe their light and shade over plain and mountain, over sleepless seas of grass, whose waves are flowers, the river's golden shores, the forests of dark pines. The song of the wild bird is on the wind, the hum of the wild bee, the music wild of waves upon the bank, of leaves upon the bough. But all is song and beauty in the land, beneath her skies of June. Then journey on, a thousand scenes like this will greet you ere the eve. Ye linger yet, ye see not, hear not now, the sunny smile, the music of today. Your thoughts are wandering up, far up the stream of time and boyhood's lore and fireside listened tales are rushing on your memories as you breathe that valley's storied name field of the grounded arms strangers no more a kindred pride of place pride in the gift of country and of name speaks in your eye and step ye tread your native land and your high thoughts are on her glorious day the solemn sabbath of the week of battle whose tempests bow to earth her foeman's banner here the forest leaves lay scattered cold and dead upon the withered grass that autumn morn when with as withered hearts and hopes as dead and cold a gallant army formed their last array upon that field in silence and deep gloom and that their conqueror's feet laid their war weapons down sullen and stern Disarmed, but not dishonoured, brave men, but brave in vain, they yielded there. The soldier's trial task is not alone to die. Honour to chivalry, the conqueror's breath stains not the ermine of his foeman's fame, nor mocks his captive's doom, the bitterest cup of war. But be that bitterest cup the doom of all, whose swords are lightning flashes in the cloud of the invader's wrath, threatening a gallant land. His army's trumpet tones wake not alone her slumbering echoes, from a thousand hills her answering voices shout, and her bells ring to arms. Then danger hovers over the invader's march, on raven wings, hushing the song of fame and glory's use of beauty fade from the cheek of death. A foe is heard in every rustling leaf, a fortress seen in every rock and tree, the eagle eye of art 
is dim and powerless then and war becomes a people's joy the drum man's merriest music and the field of death his couch of happy dreams after life's harvest home he battles heart and arm his own blue sky above him and his own green land around land of his father's grave his blessing and his prayers land where he learned to lisp a mother's name the first beloved in life the last forgot land of his frolic youth land of his bridal eve land of his children vain your columned strength invaders vain your battle steel and fire choose ye the morrow's doom a prison or a grave and such were saratoga's victors such the yeoman brave whose deeds and death have given a glory to her skies a music to her name in honourable life her fields they trod in honourable death they sleep below their sons proud feelings here their noblest monuments end of poem this recording is in the public domain Red Jacket from the Poetical Works of Fritz Green Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Red Jacket, a chief of the Indian tribes, the Tuscaroras. On looking at his portrait by Weir. Cooper, whose name is with his country's woven, first in her files, her pioneer of mind, a wanderer now in other climes, has proven his love for the young land he left behind and throned her in the senate hall of nations robed like the deluge rainbow heaven wrought magnificent as his own mind's creations and beautiful as its green world of thought and faithful to the act of congress quoted as law authority it passed nem con he writes that we are as ourselves have voted the most enlightened people ever known that all our week is happy as a sunday in paris full of song and dance and laugh and that from orleans to the bay of fundy there's not a bailiff or an epitaph and furthermore in fifty years or sooner we shall export our poetry and wine and our brave fleet eight frigates and a schooner will sweep the seas from zembla to the line if he were here with me king of tuscarora gazing as i upon thy portrait now in all its medalled fringed and beaded glory its eyes dark beauty and its thoughtful brow its brow half martial and half diplomatic its eye upsoaring like an eagle's wings well might he boast that we the democratic outrival europe even in our kings for thou wast monarch born tradition's pages tell not the planting of thy parentry but that the forest tribes have bent for ages to thee and to thy sires the subject knee thy name is princely if no poet's magic could make red jacket grace an english rhyme though some one with a genius for the tragic hath introduced it in a pantomime yet it is music in the language spoken of thine own land and on her herald roll as bravely fought for and as proud a token as coeur de lions of a warrior's soul thy garb though austria's bosom star would frighten that medal pale as diamonds the dark mine and george the fourth wore at his court at brighton a more becoming evening dress than thine yet tis a brave one scorning wind and weather and fitted for thy couch on field and flood as rob roy's tartan for the highland heather or forest green for england's robin hood is strength a monarch's merit like a whaler's thou art as tall as sinewy and as strong as earth's first kings the argos gallant sailors heroes in history and gods in song is beauty thine has with thy youth departed but the love legends of thy manhood's years and she who perished young and broken-hearted are but i rhyme for smiles and not for tears is eloquence her spell is thine that reaches the heart and makes the wisest head its sport and there's one rare strange virtue in thy speeches 
the secret of their mastery they are short the monarch mind the mystery of commanding the birth our gift the art napoleon of winning fettering moulding wielding banding the hearts of millions till they move as one thou hast it at thy bidding men have crowded the road to death as to a festival and minstrels at their sepulchres have shrouded with bannerfolds of glory the dark pall who will believe not i for in deceiving lies the dear charm of life's delightful dream i cannot spare the luxury of believing that all things beautiful are what they seem who will believe that with a smile whose blessing would like the patriarchs soothe a dying hour with voice as low as gentle and caressing as ever one maiden slip in moonlit bower with look like patient job's as chewing evil with motions graceful as a bird's in air thou art in sober truth the veriest devil that ever clenched fingers in a captive's hair that in thy breast there springs a poison fountain deadlier than that where bathes the upper tree and in thy wrath a nursing cat a mountain is calm as her babe's sleep compared with thee and underneath that face like summer oceans its lip as moveless and its cheek as clear slumbers a whirlwind of the heart's emotions love hatred pride hope sorrow all save fear love for thy land as if she were thy daughter her pipe in peace her tomahawk in wars hatred of missionaries and cold water pride in thy rifle trophies and thy scars hope that thy wrongs may be by the great spirit remembered and revenged when thou art gone sorrow that none are left thee to inherit thy name thy fame thy passions and thy throne end of poem this recording is in the public domain love from the poetical works of fitz green halleck read for librivox dot org by sonia love the imperial votress passed on in maiden meditation fancy free midsummer night's dream shall i never see a bachelor of threescore again benedict in much ado about nothing one when the tree of love is budding first ere yet its leaves are green ere yet by shower and sunbeam nursed its infant life has been the wild bee's slightest touch might wring the buds from off the tree as the gentle dip of the swallow's wing breaks the bubbles on the sea two but when its open leaves have found a home in the free air pluck them and there remains a wound that ever rankles there the blight of hope and happiness is felt when fond ones part and the bitter tear that follows is the life-blood of the heart three when the flame of love is kindled first tis the firefly's light at even tis dim as the wandering stars that burst in the blue of the summer heaven a breath can bid it burn no more or if at times its beams come on the memory they pass o'er like shadows in our dreams four but when that flame has blazed into a being and a power and smiled in scorn upon the dew that fell in its first warm hour tis the flame that curls round the martyr's head whose task is to destroy tis the lamp on the altars of the dead whose light but darkens joy five then crush even in their hour of birth the infant buds of love and tread his glowing fire to earth ere tis dark in clouds above cherish no more a cypress tree to shade thy future years nor nurse a heart flame that may be quenched only with thy tears end of poem this recording is in the public domain
A Sketch from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Her leghorn hat was of the bright gold tint The setting sunbeams give to autumn clouds. The riband that encircled it As blue as spots of sky upon a moonless night When stars are keeping revelry in heaven. A single ringlet of her clustering hair fell gracefully beneath her hat, in curls as dark as down upon the raven's wing. The kerchief, partly o'er her shoulders flung, and partly waving in the wind, was woven of every color the first rainbow wore when it came smiling in its hues of beauty, a promise from on high to a lost world. Her robe seemed of the snow just fallen to earth, pure from its home in the far winter clouds, as white as stainless. And around her waist you might have spanned it with your thumb and finger. A girdle of the hue of Indian pearls was twined, resembling the faint line of water that follows the swift bark or quiet seas. Her face I saw not, but her shape, her form, was one of those with which creating bards people a world of their own fashioning. Forms for the heart to love and cherish ever the visiting angels of our twilight dreams. Her foot was loveliest of remembered things, small as a fairy's on a moonlit leaf, listening at the wind harp's song, and watching by the wild time pillow of her sleeping queen, when proud Titania shuns her Oberon. But twas that foot which broke the spell, alas. Its stocking had a deep, deep tinge of blue. I turned away in sadness and passed on. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Domestic Happiness from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Karma Emmings the only bliss of paradise that has survived the fall. Cowper. 1. Beside the nuptial curtain bright, the bard of Eden sings. Young love his constant lamp will light and wave his purple wings. But raindrops from the cloud of care may bid that lamp be dim, and the boy love will pout and swear, tis then no place for him. 2. So mused the lovely Mrs. Dash, tis wrong to mention names, when her surly husband's cash she urged in vain her claims. I want a little money, dear, for Vandervoort and Flandin. Their bill, which now has run a year, tomorrow mean to hand in. 3. More, cried the husband, half asleep, you'll drive me to despair. The lady was too proud to weep, and too polite to swear. She bit her lip for very spite, he felt a storm was brewing, and dreamed of nothing else all night but brokers, banks, and ruin. 4. He thought her pretty once, but dreams have sure a wondrous power, for to his eyes the lady seems quite altered since that hour, and love, who on their bridal eve had promised long to stay, forgot his promise, took French leave, and bore his lamp away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Magdalen from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson A sword whose blade has ne'er been wet with blood, Except of freedom's foes, That hope which, though its sun be set, Still with a starlight beauty glows, A heart that worshipped in romance The spirit of the buried time, And dreams of night and steed and lance And lady love and minstrel rhyme, These had been, and I deemed would be, my joy, Whate'er my destiny. Born in a camp, its watch-fires bright, Alone illumined my cradle-bed, And I had borne with wild delight My banner where Bolivar led. Ere manhood's hue was on my cheek, Or manhood's pride was on my brow, Its foes are furled, The war-bird's beak is thirsty On the Andes now. I longed, like her, for other skies, Clouded by glories as sacrifice. In Greece, the brave heart's holy land, its soldier song the bugle sings, 
and I had buckled on my brand, and waited but the sea-wind's wings, to bear me where, or lost or won, her battle in its frown or smile. Men live with those of Marathon, or die with those of Sio's Isle, and find in valor's tent a tomb, in life or death a glorious home. I could have left but yesterday the scene of my boy years behind, and floated on my careless way, wherever willed the breathing wind. I could have bade adieu to aught I've sought, or met, or welcomed here, without an hour of shaded thought, a sigh, a murmur, or a tear. Such was I yesterday, but then I had not known thee, Magdalen. Today there is a change within me. There is a weight upon my brow, and fame, whose whispers once could win me from all I loved, is powerless now. There ever is a form, a face of maiden beauty in my dreams, speeding before me like the race to ocean of the mountain streams. With dancing hair and laughing eyes that seem to mock me as it flies. My sword, it slumbers in its sheath. My hopes, their starry light is gone. My heart, the fabled clock of death, beats with the same low lingering tone. And this, the land of Magdalen, seems now the only spot on earth where skies are blue and flowers are green. And here I'd build my household hearth and breathe my song of joy and twine a lovely being's name with mine. In vain, in vain the sail is spread. To see, to see my task is there. But when among the unmourned dead they lay me, and the ocean air brings tidings of my day of doom, mayst thou be then as now thou art, the lodestar of a happy home. In smile and voice, in eye and heart, the same as thou hast ever been, the loved, the lovely Magdalene. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From the Italian, from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Eyes with the same blue witchery as those of Psyche, which caught love in his own wiles, lips of the breath and hue of the red rose, that move but with kind words and sweetest smiles a power of motion and of look whose art throws silently around the wildest heart the net it would not break a form which vies with that the grecian imaged in his mind and gazed upon in dreams and sighed to find his breathing marble could not realize know ye this picture there is one alone can call its pencilled liniments her own she whom at morning when the summer air wanders delighted o'er her face of flowers and lingers in the ringlets of her hair we deem the hebe of jove's banquet ours she who at evening when her fingers press the harp and wake its harmonies divine seems sweet-voiced and loveliest of the nine the minstrel of the bowers of happiness she whom the graces nurtured at her birth the sea-born goddess and the huntress maid beings whose beauty is not of the earth came from their myrtle home and forest shade blending immortal joy with mortal mirth and diane said fair sister be she mine in her heart's purity in beauty thine the smiling infant listened and obeyed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Translation from the German of Goethe From the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Again ye come, again ye throng around me, 
dim shadowy beings of my boyhood's dream still shall i bless as then your spell that bound me still bend to mists and vapours as ye seem nearer ye come i yield me as you found me in youth your worshipper and as the stream of air that folds you in its magic wreaths flows by my lip youth's joy my bosom breathe lost forms and loved ones ye are with you bringing and dearest images of happier days first love and friendship in your path upspringing like old traditions half remembered lays and long-slept sorrows waked whose dirge like singing recalls my life's strange labyrinthine maze and names the heart mourned many a stern doom ere their years summer summoned to the tomb they hear not these my last songs they whose greeting gladdened my first my springtime friends have gone and gone fast journeying from that place of meeting the echoes of their welcome one by one those stranger crowds my listeners since are beating time to my music their applauding tone more grieves than glads me while the tried and true if yet on earth are wandering far and few the longing long unfelt the deep-drawn sighing for the far spirit world o'erpowers me now my song's faint voice sings fainter like the dying tones of the wind-harp swinging from the bough and my changed heart throbs warm no more denying tears to my eyes or sadness to my brow the near afar off seems the distant nigh the now a dream the past reality end of poem this recording is in the public domain Woman from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Amanda Kelly. Woman. Written in the album of an unknown lady. Lady, although we have not met and may not meet beneath the sky, and whether thine are eyes of jet, gray, or dark blue, or violet, or hazel, heaven knows not I. Whether around thy cheek of rose a maiden's glowing locks are curled, and to some thousand kneeling bows, thy frown is cold as winter's snows, thy smile is worth a world. Or whether, past youth's joyous strife, the calm of thought is on thy brow, and thou art in thy noon of life, loving and loved, a happy wife, and happier mother now, I know not, but... Whate'er thou art, whoe'er thou art, were mine the spell. To call fate's joys or blunt his dart, there should not be one hand or heart but served or wished thee well. For thou art woman. With that word life's dearest hopes and memories come. Truth, beauty, love. In her adored, and earth's lost paradise restored in the green bower of home. What is man's love? His vows are broke, even while his parting kiss is warm. But woman's love all change will mock, and, like the ivy round the oak, cling closest in the storm. And well the poet at her shrine may bend and worship while he woos. To him she is a thing divine, the inspiration of his line his loved one, and his muse. If to his song the echo rings, of fame, tis woman's voice he hears. If ever from his lyre's proud strings flow sounds like rush of angel wings, tis that she listens while he sings, with blended smiles and tears. Smiles, tears, whose blessed and blessing power, like sun and dew o'er summer's tree, 
alone keeps green through time's long hour, that frailer thing than leaf or flower, a poet's immortality. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Poet's Daughter from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone For the Album of Miss Blank at the Request of Her Father A lady asks the minstrel's rhyme a lady asks there was a time when musical as playbells chime to wearied boy that sound would summon dreams sublime of pride and joy but now the spell hath lost its sway life's first-born fancies first decay gone are the plumes and pennants gay of young romance there linger but her ruins grey and broken lance tis a new world no more to maid warrior or bard is homage paid the bay trees laurels myrtle shade men's thoughts resign heaven placed us here to vote and trade twin tasks divine tis youth tis beauty ask the green and growing leaves of seventeen are round her and half hid half seen a violet flower nursed by the virtue she hath been from childhood's hour blind passion's picture yet for this we woo the lifelong bridal kiss and blend our every hope of bliss with hers we love unmindful of the serpent's hiss in eden's grove beauty the fading rainbow's pride youth twas the charm of her who died at dawn and by her coffin's side a grandsire stands age strengthened like the oak storm tried of mountain lands youth's coffin hush the tale it tells be silent memory's funeral bells lone in one heart her home it dwells untold till death and where the grave mound greenly swells or buried faith but what if hers are rank and power armies her train a throne her bower a kingdom's gold her marriage dower broad seas and lands what if from bannered hall and tower a queen commands a queen earth's regal moons have set where perished mary and Toinette. where's bordeaux's mother where the jet black haitian dame and lusitania's coronet and angulame empires to-day are upside down the castle kneels before the town the monarch fears a printer's frown a brickbat's range give me in preference to a crown five shillings change but her who asks though first among the good the beautiful the young the birthright of a spell more strong than these hath brought her she is your kinswoman in song a poet's daughter a poet's daughter could i claim the consanguinity of fame veins of my intellectual frame your blood would glow proudly to sing that gentlest name of aught below a poet's daughter dearer word lip hath not spoke nor listener heard fit theme for song of bee and bird from morn till even and wind harp by the breathing stirred of starlit heaven my spirit's wings are weak the fire poetic comes but to expire her name needs not my humble lyre to bid it live she hath already from her sire all bard can give end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Connecticut from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck read for LibriVox.org by Alan Matstone from an unpublished poem the woods in which we had dwelt pleasantly rustled their green leaves in the song and our streams were there with the sound of all their waters montrose still her grey rocks tower above the sea that crouches at their feet a conquered wave tis a rough land of earth and stone and tree where breathes no castled lord nor cabin slave where thoughts and tongues and hands are bold and free and friends will find a welcome foes a grave and where none kneel save when to heaven they pray nor even then unless in their own way theirs is a pure republic wild yet strong a fierce democracy where all are true to what themselves have voted right or wrong and to their laws denominated blue if read they might to draco's code belong a vestal state which power could not subdue nor promise win like her own eagle's nest sacred the San Marino of the West. A justice of the peace, for the time being, they bow to, but may turn him out next year. They reverence their priest, but disagreeing, in price or creed, dismiss him without fear. They have a natural talent for foreseeing and knowing all things and should park appear from his long tour of africa to show the niger's source they'd meet him with we know they love their land because it is their own and scorn to give aught other reason why would shake hands with a king upon his throne and think it kindness to his majesty a stubborn race fearing and flattering none such are they nurtured such they live and die all but a few apostates who are meddling with merchandise pounds shillings pence and peddling or wandering through the southern countries teaching the a b c from webster's spelling book gallant and godly making love and preaching and gaining by what they call hook and crook and what the moralists call overreaching a decent living the virginians look upon them with as favourable eyes as gabriel on the devil in paradise but these are but their outcasts view them near at home where all their worth and pride is placed and there their hospitable fires burn clear and there the lowliest farmhouse hearth is graced with manly hearts in piety sincere faithful in love in honour stern and chaste in friendship warm and true in danger brave beloved in life and sainted in the grave and minds have there been nurtured whose control is felt even in their nation's destiny men who swayed senates with a statesman's soul and looked on armies with a leader's eye names that adorn and dignify the scroll whose leaves contain their country's history and tales of love and war listen to one of the green mountaineer the stark of bennington when on that field his band the hessians fought briefly he spoke before the fight began soldiers those german gentlemen are bought for four pound eight and sevenpence per man by england's king a bargain as is thought are we worth more 
let's prove it now we can for we must beat them boys ere set of sun or mary stark's a widow it was done hers are not tempe's nor arcadia's spring nor the long summer of cathayan vales the vines the flowers the air the skies that fling such wild enchantment o'er boccaccio's tales of florence and the arno yet the wing of life's best angel health is on her gales through sun and snow and in the autumn time earth has no purer and no lovelier clime her clear warm heaven at noon the mist that shrouds her twilight hills her cool and starry eaves the glorious splendour of her sunset clouds the rainbow beauty of her forest leaves come o'er the eye in solitude and crowds where'er his web of song her poet weaves and his mind's brightest vision but displays the autumn scenery of his boyhood days and when you dream of woman and her love her truth her tenderness her gentle power the maiden listening in the moonlight grove the mother smiling in her infant's bower forms features worshipped while we breathe or move be by some spirits of your dreaming hour born like loretto's chapel through the air to the green land i sing then wake you'll find them there end of poem this recording is in the public domain Music from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee. To a boy of four years old, on hearing him play on the harp. Sweet boy, before thy lips can learn in speech thy wishes to make known, are thoughts that breathe and words that burn heard in thy music's tone. Were genius tasked to prove the might, the magic of her hidden spell, she might well name thee with delight as her own miracle. Who that hath heard from summer trees the sweet wild song of summer birds when morning to the far-off breeze whispers her bidding words? Or listen to the bird of night, the minstrel of the starlight hours, companion of the firefly's flight, cool dews and closed flowers? but deemed that spirits of the air had left their native homes in heaven, and that the music warbled there to earth a while was given? For with that music came the thought that life's young purity was theirs, and love, all artless and untaught, breathed in their woodland airs. And when, sweet boy, thy baby fingers wake sounds of heaven's own harmony, how welcome is the thought that lingers upon thy lyre and thee. It calls up visions of past days, when life was infancy and song, to us and old remembered lays, unheard, unheeded long. Revive in joy or grief within us, like lost friends wakened from their sleep, with all their early power to win us, alike to smile or weep. And when we gaze upon that face, blooming in innocence and truth, and mark its dimpled artlessness, its beauty and its youth, we think of better worlds than this, of other beings pure as thou, who breathe on winds of paradise, music as thine is now, and know the only emblem meet of that pure faith the heart adores, to be a child like thee, whose feet are strangers on life's shores. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
on the death of Lieutenant William Howard Allen of the American Navy from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Horlock, read for LibriVox.org by Inko. He hath been mourned as brave men mourn the brave, and wept as nations weep their cherished dead, with bitter but proud tears, and o'er his head, the eternal flowers whose root is in the grave, the flowers of fame are beautiful and green, and by his graveside pilgrim feet have been, and blessings, pure as men to martyrs give, have there been breathed by those he died to save, pride of his country's banded chivalry. His fame their hope, his name their battle cry, he lived as mothers wish their sons to live, he died as fathers wish their sons to die. If on the grief-worn cheek the hues of bliss, which fade when all we love is in the tomb, could ever know on earth a second bloom, the memory of a gallant death like his would call them into being, but the few, who as their friend, their brother, or their son, his kind warm heart and gentle spirit knew, had long lived, hoped, and feared for him alone, his voice their morning music, and his eye, the only starlight of their evening sky, till even the sun of happiness seemed dim, and life's best joys were sorrows but with him, and when, the burning bullet in his breast, he dropped, like summer fruit from off the bough, there was one heart that knew and loved him best, it was a mother's, and is broken now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fanny, from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Verses 1 to 24 a fairy vision of some gay creatures of the element that in the colours of the rainbow live and play in the plighted clouds milton fanny was younger once than she is now and prettier of course i do not mean to say that there are wrinkles on her brow yet to be candid she is past eighteen perhaps past twenty but the girl is shy about her age and heaven forbid that i should get myself in trouble by revealing a secret of this sort i have too long loved pretty women with a poet's feeling and when a boy in daydream and in song have knelt me down and worshipped them alas they never thanked me for it but let that pass i felt for many a heartache in my day at the mere rustling of a muslin gown and caught some dreadful colds i blush to say while shivering in the shade of beauty's frown they say her smiles are sunbeams it may be but never a sunbeam would she throw on me but fanny's is an eye that you may gaze on for half an hour without the slightest harm e'en when she wore her smiling summer face on there was but little danger and the charm that youth and wealth once gave has bade farewell hers is a sad sad tale tis mine its woes to tell her father kept some fifteen years ago a retail dry-goods shop in chatham street and nursed his little earnings sure though slow till having mustered wherewithal to meet the gaze of the great world he breathed the air of pearl street and set up in hanover square money is power tis said i never tried i'm but a poet and bank-notes to me are curiosity as closely eyed whenever i get them as a stone would be tossed from the moon on dr mitchell's table or classic brickbat from the tower of babel but he i sing of well has known and felt that money hath a power and a dominion for when in chatham street the good man dwelt no one would give a sou for his opinion 
and though his neighbours were extremely civil yet on the whole they thought him a poor devil a decent kind of person one whose head was not of brains particularly full it was not known that he had ever said anything worth repeating twas a dull good honest man what pauding's muse would call a cabbage head but he excelled them all in that most noble of the sciences the art of making money and he found the zeal for quizzing him grew less and less as he grew richer till upon the ground of pearl street treading proudly in the might and majesty of wealth a sudden light flashed like the midnight lightning on the eyes of all who knew him brilliant traits of mind and genius clear and countless as the dyes upon the peacock's plumage taste refined wisdom and wit were his perhaps much more twas strange they had not found it out before in this quick transformation it is true that cash had no small share but there were still some other causes which then gave a new impulse to head and heart and joined to fill his brain with knowledge for there first he met the editor of the new york gazette the sapient mr lang the world of him knows much yet not one half so much as he knows of the world up to its very brim the goblet of his mind is sparkling free with lore and learning had proud sheba's queen in all her bloom and beauty but have seen this modern solomon the israelite earth's monarch as he was had never won her he would have hanged himself for very spite and she blessed woman might have had the honour of some neat paragraphs worth all the lays that judah's minstrel warbled in her praise her star arose too soon but that which swayed the ascendant at our merchant's natal hour was bright with better destiny its aid led him to pluck within the classic bower of bulletins the blossoms of true knowledge and lang supplied the loss of school and college for there he learned the news some minutes sooner than others could and to distinguish well the different signals whether ship or schooner hoisted its staten island and to tell the change of wind and of his neighbour's fortunes and best of all he there learned self-importance nor were these all the advantages derived from change of scene for near his domicile he of the pair of polished lamps then lived and in my hero's promenades at will could he behold them burning and their flame kindled within his breast the love of fame and politics and country the pure glow of patriot ardour and the consciousness that talents such as his might well bestow a lustre on the city she would bless his name and that some service should be done her he pledged life fortune and his sacred honour and when the sounds of music and of mirth bursting from fashion's groups assembled there were heard as round their lone plebeian hearth fanny and he were seated he would dare to whisper fondly that the time might come when he and his could give as brilliant rights at home and off would fanny near that mansion linger when the cold winter moon was high in heaven and trace out by the aid of fancy's finger cars for some future party to be given when she in turn should be a bell and they had lived their little hour and passed away there are some happy moments in this lone and desolate world of ours 
that well repay the toil of struggling through it and atone for many a long sad night and weary day they come upon the mind like some wild air of distant music when we know not where or whence the sounds are brought from and their power though brief is boundless that far future home oft dreamed of beckons near its rose-wreathed bower and cloudless skies before us we become changed on the instant all gold leaf and gilding this is in vulgar phrase called castle building but these like sunset clouds fade soon tis vain to bid them linger longer or to ask on what day they intend to call again and surely twere a philosophic task worthy a mitchell in his hours of leisure to find some means to summon them at pleasure there certainly are powers of doing this in some degree at least for instance drinking champagne will bathe the heart a while in bliss and keep the head a little time from thinking of cares or creditors the best wine in town you'll get from lynch the cash must be paid down but if you are a bachelor like me and spurn all chains even though made of roses i'd recommend cigars there is a free and happy spirit that unseen reposes on the dim shadowy clouds that hover o'er you when smoking quietly with a warm fire before you End of verses 1 to 24. This recording is in the public domain. Fanny, from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Verses 25 to 45 dear to the exile is his native land in memory's twilight beauty seen afar dear to the broker is a note of hand collaterally secured the polar star is dear at midnight to the sailor's eyes and dear are bristed's volumes at half price but dearer far to me each fairy minute spent in that fond forgetfulness of grief there is an airy web of magic in it as in othello's pocket handkerchief veiling the wrinkles on the brow of sorrow the gathering gloom to-day the thunder-cloud to-morrow and these are innocent thoughts a man may sit upon a bright throne of his own creation untortured by the ghastly sprites that flit around the many whose exalted station has been attained by means to a pain to hint on just for the rhyme's sake instance mr clinton he struggled hard but not in vain and breathes the mountain air at last but there are others who strove like him to win the glittering wreaths of power his early partisans and brothers that linger yet in dust from whence they sprung unhonoured and unpaid though luckily unhung twas theirs to fill with gas the huge balloon of party and they hoped when it arose to soar like eagles in the blaze of noon above the gaping crowd of friends and foes alas like guillet's car it soared without them and left them with a mob to jeer and flout them though fanny's moonlight dreams were sweet as those i've dwelt so long upon 
they were more stable hers were not castles in the air that rose based upon nothing for her sire was able as well she knew to buy out the one half of fashion's glittering train that nightly quaff wine wit and wisdom at a midnight rout from dandy coachman whose exquisite grin and ruffian lounge flash brilliantly without down to their brother dandies ranged within gay as the brussels carpeting they tread on and sapient as the oysters they are fed on and rumour she's a famous liar yet tis wonderful how easy we believe her had whispered he was rich and all he met in wall street nodded smiled and tipped the beaver all from mr gelston the collector down to the broker and the bank director a few brief years passed over and his rank among the worthies of that street was fixed he had become director of a bank and six insurance offices and mixed familiarly as one among his peers with grocers dry good merchants auctioneers brokers of all grades stock and pawn and jews of all religions who at noonday form on change that brotherhood the moral muse delights in where the heart is pure and warm and each exerts his intellectual force to cheat his neighbour legally of course and there he shone a planetary star circled around by lesser orbs whose beams from his were borrowed the simile is not far from truth for many bosom friends it seems did borrow from him and sometimes forget to pay indeed they have not paid him yet but these he deemed as trifles when each mouth was open in his praise and plaud its rose upon his willing ear like the sweet south upon a bank of violets from those who knew his talents virtues and so forth that is knew how much money he was worth alas poor human nature had he been but satisfied with this his golden days their setting hour of darkness had not seen and he might still in the mercantile phrase be living in good order and condition but he was ruined by that jade ambition that last infirmity of noble minds whose spell like whisky your true patriot liquor to politics the lofty heart inclines of all from clinton down to the bill sticker of a ward meeting she came slyly creeping to his bedside where he lay snug and sleeping her brow was turbaned with a bucktail wreath a brooch of terrapin her bosom wore tomkins letter was just seen beneath her arm and in her hand on high she bore a national advocate pell's polite review lay at her feet twas pummelled black and blue she was in fashion's elegant undress muffled from throat to ankle and her hair was all en papillo each auburn tress prettily pinned apart you well might swear she was no beauty yet when made up ready for visitors twas quite another lady since that wise pedant johnson was in fashion manners have changed as well as moons and he would fret himself once more into a passion should he return which heaven forbid 
and see how strangely from his standard dictionary the meaning of some words is made to vary for instance an undress at present means the wearing a pelisse a shawl or so or anything you please in short that screens the face and hides the form from top to toe of power to brave a quizzing glass or storm tis worn in summer when the weather's warm but a full dress is for a winter's night the most genteel is made of woven air that kind of classic cobweb soft and light which lady morgan's ida used to wear and ladies this aerial manner dressed in look eve-like angel-like and interesting but miss ambition was as i was saying deshabille his bedside tripping near and gently on his nose her fingers laying she roared out tammany in his frighted ear the potent word awoke him from his nap and then she vanished whispering verbum sap the last words were beyond his comprehension for he had left off schooling ere the greek or latin classics claimed his mind's attention besides he often had been heard to speak contemptuously of all that sort of knowledge taught so profoundly in columbia college End of verses twenty five to forty five. This recording is in the public domain. Fanny from the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Verses forty six to seventy eight. We owe the ancients something. You have read their works, no doubt at least in a translation yet there was argument in what he said a scorn equivocation or evasion and own it must in candour be confessed they were an ignorant set of men at best twas their misfortune to be born too soon by centuries and in the wrong place too they never saw a steamboat or balloon velocipede or quarterly review or wore a pair of bears black satin breeches or read an almanac or clinton's speeches in short in everything we far outshine them art science taste and talent and a stroll through this enlightened city would refine them more than ten years hard study of the whole their genius has produced of rich and rare god bless the corporation and the mayor in sculpture we've a grace the grecian master blushing had owned his purest model lacks we've mr bogart in the best of plaster the witch of endor in the best of wax besides the head of franklin on the roof of mr lang both jest and weatherproof and on our city hall a justice stands a neater form was never made of board holding majestically in her hands a pair of steelyards and a wooden sword and looking down with complacent civility emblem of dignity and durability in painting we have trumbull's proud chef-d'oeuvre blending in one the funny and the fine his independence will endure forever and so will mr allen's lottery sign and all that grace the academy of arts from dr hosack's face to bonaparte's in architecture our unrivalled skill Cullen's magnesian shop has loudly spoken to an admiring world, and better still is Gautier's fairy palace at Hoboken. In music, we have the Utopian society and amateurs, a wonderful variety. In physic, we have Francis and McNevin, famed for long heads, short lectures, and long bills, and Quackenboss and others who from heaven were rained upon us in a shower of pills they'd beat the deathless esculapius hollow 
and make a starveling druggist of apollo and who that ever slumbered at the forum but owns the first of orators we claim cicero would have bowed the knee before them and for law eloquence we've dr graham compared with him their justins and quintilians had dwindled into second-rate civilians for purity and chastity of style there's pal's preface and puffs by horn and weight for penetration deep and learned toil and all that stamps an author truly great have we not bristed's ponderous tomes a treasure for any man of patience and of leisure oxonian bristed many a fool's cap page he in his time hath written and moreover what few will do in this degenerate age hath read his own works as you may discover by counting his quotations from himself you'll find the books on any auction shelf i beg great britain's pardon tis not meant to claim this oxford scholar as our own that he was shipped off here to represent her literature among us is well known and none could better fill the lofty station of learning's envoy from the british nation we fondly hope that he will be respected at home and soon obtain a place or pension we should regret to see him live neglected like pharon ash and others we could mention who paid us friendly visits to abuse our country and find food for the reviews but to return the Haliconian waters are sparkling in their native fount no more and after years of wandering the nine daughters of poetry have found upon our shore a happier home and on their sacred shrines glow in immortal ink the polished lines of woodworth dr farmer moses scott names hallowed by their readers sweetest smile and who that reads at all has read them not that blind old man of seo's rocky isle homer was well enough but would he ever have written think ye the backwoodsman never alas for paulding i regret to see in such a stanza one whose giant powers seen in their native element will be known to a future age the pride of ours there is none breathing who can better wield the battle axe of satire on its field the wreath he fought for he has bravely won long be its laurel green around his brow it is too true i'm somewhat fond of fun and jesting but for once i'm serious now why is he sipping weak castalian dews the muse has damned him let him damn the muse but to return once more the ancients fought some tolerable battles marathon is still a theme for high and holy thought and many a poet's lay we linger on the page that tells us of the brave and free and reverence thy name unmatched thermopylae and there were spirited troops in other days the roman legion and the spartan band and swordward's gallant corps the iron grace soldiers who met their foemen hand to hand or swore at least to meet them undismayed yet what were these to general late's brigade of veterans nursed in that free school of glory the new york state militia from bellevue even to the battery flagstaff the proud story of their maneuvers at the last review has rang and clinton's order told afar he never led a better corps to war what egypt was thy magic to the tricks of mr charles judge spencer or van buren the first with cards the last in politics a conjurer's fame for years have been securing and who would now the athenian dramas read when he can get wall street by mr mead i might say much about our lettered men those grave and reverend seigneurs who compose our learned societies but here my pen stops short for they themselves the rumour goes the exclusive privilege by patent claim of trumpeting as the phrase is their own fame and therefore i am silent it remains to bless the hour the corporation took it into their heads to give the rich in brains the worn-out mansion of the poor in pocket once the old almshouse now a school of wisdom sacred to scudder's shells and dr griscom but whither am i wandering 
the esteem i bear this fair city of the heart to me a dear enthusiastic theme has forced me all unconsciously to part too long from him the hero of my story where was he waking from his dream of glory and she the lady of his dream had fled and left him somewhat puzzled and confused he understood however half she said and that is quite as much as we are used to comprehend or fancy worth repeating in speeches heard at any public meeting and the next evening found him at the hall there he was welcomed by the cordial hand and met the warm and friendly grasp of all who take like watchmen there their nightly stand a ring as in a boxing match procuring to bet on clinton tompkins or van buren twas a propitious moment for a while the waves of party were at rest upon each complacent brow was gay good humour's smile and there was much of wit and jest and pun and high amid the circle in great glee sat croker's old acquaintance john targee his jokes excelled the rest and oft he sang songs patriotic as in duty bound he had a little of the nasal twang heard at conventicle but yet you found in him a dash of purity and brightness that spoke the man of taste and of politeness for he had been it seems the bosom friend of england's prettiest bard anacreon moore they met when he the bard came here to lend his mirth and music to this favourite shore for as the proverb saith birds of a feather instinctively will flock and fly together the winds that wave thy cedar boughs are breathing lake of the dismal swamp that poet's name and the spray showers their noonday halos wreathing around Cohoes are brightened by his fame and bright its sunbeam over st lawrence smiles her million lilies and her thousand isles we hear his music in her ormond lay and where her church bells toll the evening chime yet when to him the grateful heart would pay its homage now and in all coming time up springs a doubtful question whether we owe it to tara's minstrel or targhee together oft they wandered many a spot now consecrated as the minstrels seem by words of beauty never to be forgot their mutual feet have trod and when the stream of thought and feeling flowed in mutual speech twere vain to tell how much each taught to each but from the following song it would appear that he of erin from the sachem took the model of his bower of bendemir one of the sweetest airs in lalla rook tis to be hoped that in his next edition this the original will find admission End of verses forty six to seventy eight. This recording is in the public domain. Song from Fanny from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. There's a barrel of porter at Tammany Hall, and the bucktails are swigging it all the night long. In the time of my boyhood, twas pleasant to call for a seat and a cigar mid the jovial throng. That beer and those bucktails I never forget, but oft when alone and unnoticed by all, I think, is the porter cast foaming there yet? Are the bucktails still swigging at Tammany Hall? No, the porter was out long before it was stale, but some blossoms on many a nose brightly shone and the speeches inspired by the fumes of the ale had the fragrance of porter when porter was gone how much cousins will draw of such beer ere he dies is a question of moment to me and to all for still dear to my soul as twas then to my eyes is that barrel of porter at tammany hall there's a bower of roses by bendemere's stream and the nightingale sings round it all the night long in the time of my childhood twas like a sweet dream 
to sit in the roses and hear the bird's song that bower and its music i never forget but oft when alone in the bloom of the year i think is the nightingale singing there yet are the roses still bright by the calm bendemeer no the roses soon withered that hung o'er the wave but some blossoms were gathered while freshly they shone and a dew was distilled from their flowers that gave all the fragrance of summer when summer was gone thus memory draws from delight ere it dies an essence that breathes of it many a year thus bright to my soul as twas then to my eyes is that bower on the banks of the calm bendemere end of poem this recording is in the public domain fanny from the poetical works of fitzgreen hallock read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone Verses 79 to 103 For many months my hero ne'er neglected To take his ramble there, and soon found out In much less time than one could have expected What t'was they all were quarrelling about. He learned the party countersigns by rote, And when to clap his hands, and how to vote he learned that clinton became governor somehow by chance when we were all asleep that he had neither sense nor talent nor any good quality and would not keep his place an hour after the next election so powerful was the voice of disaffection that he was a mere puppet made to play a thousand tricks while spencer touched the springs spencer the mighty warwick of his day that set her up and pull her down of kings aided by miller pell and dr graham and other men of equal worth and fame and that he'd set the people at defiance by placing knaves and fools in public stations and that his works in literature and science were but a schoolboy's web of misquotations and that he'd quoted from the devil even better to reign in hell than serve in heaven to these authentic facts each bucktail swore but clinton's friends averred in contradiction they were but fables told by mr noah who had a privilege to deal in fiction because he'd written travels and a melodrama and was withal a pleasant fellow and they declared that tomkins was no better than he should be that he had borrowed money and paid it not in cash but with a letter and though some trifling service he had done he still wanted spirit energy and fire and was disliked by mr mcintyre in short each one with whom in conversation he joined contrived to give him different views of men and measures and the information which he obtained but aided to confuse his brain at best was never very clear and now twas turned with politics and beer and he was puffed and flattered and caressed by all till he sincerely thought that nature had formed him for an alderman at least perhaps a member of the legislature and that he had the talents ten times over of henry meigs or peter h wendover the man was mad tis plain and merits pity or he had never dared in such a tone to speak of two great persons whom the city with pride and pleasure points to as her own men wise in council brilliant in debate the expectancy and rose of the fair state 
the one for a pure style and classic manner is mr sanchem mooney far before the other in his speech about the banner spellbound his audience until they swore that such a speech was never heard till then and never would be till he spoke again though twas presumptuous in this friend of ours to think of rivalling these i must allow that still the man had talents and the powers of his capacious intellect were now improved by foreign travel and by reading and at the hall he learned of course good breeding he had read the newspapers with great attention advertisements and all and riley's book of travels valued for its rich invention and day and turner's price current and took the edinburgh and quarterly reviews and also colonel pell's and to amuse his leisure hours with classic tale and story longworth's dictionary and mead's wall street and mr della plain's repository and mitchell's scientific works complete with other standard books of modern days lay on his table covered with green bays his travels had extended to bath races and bloomingdale and bergen he had seen and harlem heights and many other places by sea and land had visited and been in a steamboat of the vice-presidents to staten island once for fifty cents and he had dined by special invitation on turtle with the party at hoboken and thanked them for his card in an oration declared to be the shortest ever spoken and he had strolled one day o'er weehawk hill a day worth all the rest he recollects it still weehawken in thy mountain scenery yet or we adore of nature in her wild and frolic hour of infancy is met and never has a summer's morning smiled upon a lovelier scene than the full eye of the enthusiast revels on when high amid thy forest solitudes he climbs o'er crags that proudly tower above the deep and knows that sense of danger which sublimes the breathless moment when his daring step is on the verge of the cliff and he can hear the low dash of the waves with startled ear like the death music of his coming doom and clings to the green turf with desperate force as the heart clings to life and when resume the currents in his veins their wonted course there lingers a deep feeling like the moan of wearied ocean when the storm is gone in such an hour he turns and on his view ocean and earth and heaven burst before him clouds slumbering at his feet and the clear blue of summer's sky in beauty bending o'er him the city bright below and far away sparkling in golden light his own romantic bay tall spire and glittering roof and battlement and banners floating in the sunny air and white sails o'er the calm blue waters bent green isle and circling shore are blended there in wild reality when life is old and many a scene forgot the heart will hold its memory of this nor lives there one whose infant breath was drawn or boyhood's days of happiness were passed beneath that sun that in his manhood's prime can calmly gaze upon that bay or on that mountain stand nor feel the prouder of his native land this may be poetry for aught i know said an old worthy friend of mine while leaning over my shoulder as i wrote although i can't exactly comprehend its meaning for my part i have long been a petitioner 
to mr john mccomb the street commissioner that he would think of weehawk and would lay it handsomely out in avenue and square then tax the land and make its owners pay it as is the usual plan pursued elsewhere blow up the rocks and sell the wood for fuel twould save us many a dollar and a jewel the devil take you and john mccomb said i lang in its praise has penned one paragraph and promised me another i defy with such assistance yours and the world's laugh and half believe that paulding on this theme might be a poet strange as it may seem for even our traveller felt when home returning from that day's tour as on the deck he stood the fire of poetry within him burning albeit unused to the rhyming mood and with a pencil on his knee he wrote the following flaming lines end of verses seventy nine to one hundred and three this recording is in the public domain to the horseboat from the poetical works of fitzgreen halleck read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone away o'er the wave to the home we are seeking bark of my hope ere the evening be gone there's a wild wild note in the curlew shrieking there's a whisper of death in the wind's low moan though blue and bright are the heavens above me and the stars are asleep on the quiet sea and hearts i love and hearts that love me are beating beside me merrily yet far in the west where the day's faded roses touched by the moonbeam are withering fast where the half-seen spirit of twilight reposes hymning the dirge of the hours that are past there where the ocean wave sparkles at meeting as sunset dreams tell us the kiss of the sky on his dim dark cloud is the infant storm sitting and beneath the horizon his lightnings are nigh another hour and the death word is given another hour and his lightnings are here speed speed thee my bark ere the breeze of even is lost in the tempest our home will be near then away o'er the wave while thy pennant is streaming in the shadowy light like a shooting star be swift as the thought of the wanderer dreaming in a stranger land of his fireside afar and while memory lingers i'll fondly believe thee a being with life and its best feelings warm and freely the wild song of gratitude weave thee blessed spirits that bore me and mine from the storm End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fanny from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Verses 104 to 141. But where is Fanny? She has long been thrown where cheeks and roses wither in the shade. The age of chivalry, you know, is gone and although as i once before have said i love a pretty face to adoration yet still i must preserve my reputation as a true dandy of the modern schools one hates to be old-fashioned it would be a violation of the latest rules to treat the sex with too much courtesy tis not to worship beauty as she glows in all her diamond lustre that the bows of these enlightened days at evening crowd where fashion welcomes in her rooms of light that dignified obedience that proud submission which in times of yore the knight gave to his lady love is now a scandal and practised only by your goth or vandal to lounge in graceful attitudes be stared upon the while by every fair one's eye 
and stare oneself in turn to be prepared to dart upon the trays as swiftly by the dexterous simon bears them and to take one's share at least of coffee cream and cake is now to be the tongue the pouting lip and sad upbraiding eye of the poor girl who hardly of joy's cup one drop can sip ere in the wild confusion and the whirl and tumult of the hour its bubbles vanish must now be disregarded one must banish those antiquated feelings that belong to feudal manners and a barbarous age time was when woman poured her soul in song that all was hushed around tis now the rage to deem a song like bugle tones in battle a signal note that bids each tongue's artillery rattle and therefore i have made miss fanny wait my leisure she had changed as you will see as much as her worthy sire and made as great proficiency in taste and high ideas the careless smile of other days was gone and every gesture spoke qu'en dira-t-on she long had known that in her father's coffers and also to his credit in the banks there was some cash and therefore all the offers made her by gentlemen of the middle ranks of heart and hand had spurned as far beneath one whose high destiny it was to breathe ere long the air of broadway or park place and reign a fairy queen in fairyland display in the gay dance her form of grace or touch with rounded arm and gloveless hand harp or piano madame catilani forgot a while and every eye on fanny and in anticipation of that hour her star of hope her paradise of thought she'd had as many masters as the power of riches could bestow and had been taught the thousand nameless graces that adorn the daughters of the wealthy and high-born she had been noticed at some public places the battery and the balls of mr whale for hers was one of those attractive faces that when you gaze upon them never fail to bid you look again there was a beam a lustre in her eye that oft would seem a little like effrontery and yet the lady meant no harm her only aim was but to be admired by all she met and the free homage of the heart to claim and if she showed too plainly this intention others have done the same twas not of her invention she shone at every concert where are bought tickets by all who wish them for a dollar she patronized the theatre and thought that wallach looked extremely well in rolla she fell in love as all the ladies do with mr simpson talked as loudly too as any beauty of the highest grade to the gay circle in the box beside her and when the pit half vexed and half afraid with looks of smothered indignation eyed her she calmly met their gaze and stood before them smiling at vulgar taste and mock decorum and though by no means a bar bleu she had for literature a most becoming passion had skimmed the latest novels good and bad and read the croakers when they were in fashion and dr chalmers sermons of a sunday and woodward's cabinet and the new salma gandhi she was among the first and warmest patrons of griscom's conversaciones where in rainbow groups our bright-eyed maids and matrons on science bent assemble to prepare themselves for acting well in life their part as wives and mothers there she learned by heart words to the witches in macbeth unknown hydraulics hydrostatics and pneumatics dioptrics optics catoptrics carbon chlorine and iodine and aerostatics also why frogs for want of air expire and how to set the tap and sea on fire in all the modern languages she was exceedingly well versed and had devoted to their attainment far more time than has by the best teachers lately been allotted for she had taken lessons twice a week for a full month in each and she could speak french and italian equally as well as chinese portuguese or german and what is still more surprising she could spell most of our longest english words off-hand 
was quite familiar in low Dutch and Spanish, and thought of studying modern Greek and Danish. She sang divinely, and in Love's Young Dream, and Fanny Dearest, and The Soldier's Bride, and every song whose dear delightful theme is love still love had oft till midnight tried her finest loftiest pigeon wings of sound waking the very watchman far around for her pure taste in dress i can appeal to madame bouquet and monsieur pardessus she was in short a woman you might kneel to if kneeling were in fashion or if you were wearied of your dunce and single life and wanted a few thousands and a wife there was a sound of revelry by night broadway was thronged with coaches and within a mansion of the best of brick the bright and eloquent eyes of beauty bade begin the dance and music's tones swelled wild and high and hearts and heels kept tune in tremulous ecstasy for many a week the note of preparation had sounded through all circles far and near and some five hundred cars of invitation bade bow and bell in full costume appear there was a most magnificent variety all quite select and of the first society that is to say the rich and the well-bred the arbiters of fashion and gentility in different grades of splendour from the head down to the very toe of our nobility ladies remarkable for handsome eyes or handsome fortunes learned men and wise statesmen and officers of the militia in short the first society a phrase which you may understand as best may fit you besides the blackest fiddlers of those days placed like their sire timotheus on high with horsehair fiddle bows and teeth of ivory the carpets were rolled up the day before and with a breath two rooms became at one like man and wife and on the polished floor chalk in the artist's plastic hand had done all that chalk could do in young eden's bowers they seemed to tread and their feet pressed on flowers and when the thousand lights of sperma city streamed like a shower of sunbeams and free tresses wild as the heads that waved them and the pretty collection of the latest paris dresses wandered about the room like things divine it was as i was told extremely fine the love of fun fine faces and good eating brought many who were tired of self and home and some were there in the high hope of meeting the lady of their bosom's love and some to study that deep science how to please and manners in high life and high-souled courtesies and he the hero of the night was there in breeches of light drab and coat of blue taste was conspicuous in his powdered hair and in his frequent jeu de mots that drew peals of applauses from the listeners round who were delighted as in duty bound twas fanny's father fanny near him stood her power resistless and her wish command and hope's young promises were all made good she reigned a fairy queen in fairyland her dream of infancy a dream no more and then how beautiful the dress she wore ambition with the sire had kept her word he had the rose no matter for its thorn and he seemed happy as a summer bird careering on wet wing to meet the morn some said there was a cloud upon his brow it might be but we'll not discuss that now i left him making rhymes while crossing o'er the broad and perilous wave of the north river he bade adieu when safely on the shore to poetry and as he thought forever that night his dream if after deeds make known our plans in sleep was an enchanting one he woke in strength like samson from his slumber and walked broadway and raptured the next day purchased a house there i forgot the number and signed the mortgage and the bond for pay gave in the slang phrase pearl street the go-by and cut for several months st tammany bond mortgage title deeds and all completed he bought a coach and half a dozen horses the bills at lawrence's not yet receipted you'll find the amount upon his list of losses then filled his rooms with servants and whatever is necessary for a genteel liver 
This last removal fixed him. Every stain was blotted from his household coat, and he now showed the world he was a gentleman, and what is better, could afford to be. His step was loftier than it was of old, his laugh less frequent, and his manner told what lovers call unutterable things. That sort of dignity was in his mien which awes the gazer into eyes and brings to recollection some great man we've seen the governor perchance whose eye and frown twas shrewdly guessed would knock judge skinner down and for resources both of purse and head he was a subject worthy bristet's pen believed devoutly all his flatterers said and deemed himself a croesus among men spread to the liberal air his silken sails and lavished guineas like a prince of Wales. End of verses 104 to 141. This recording is in the public domain. Fanny from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Verses 142 to 175. He mingled now with those within whose veins the blood ran pure, the magnates of the land, hailed them as his companions and his friends, and lent them money and his note of hand. In every institution whose proud aim is public good alone, he soon became a man of consequence and notoriety. His name, with the addition of Esquire, stood high upon the list of each society, whose zeal and watchfulness the sacred fire of science agriculture art and learning keep on our country's altars bright and burning at eastburn's rooms he met at two each day with men of taste and judgment like his own and played first fiddle in that orchestra of literary worthies and the tone of his mind's music by the listeners caught is traced among them still in language and in thought he once made the Lyceum a choice present of mussel shells, picked up at Rockaway, and Mitchell gave a classical and pleasant discourse about them in the streets that day, naming the shells, and hard to put in verse twas, testaceous coverings of bivalve molluscas. He was a trustee of a savings bank, and lectured soundly every evildoer, gave dinners daily to wealth, power, and rank, and sixpence every Sunday to the poor. He was a wit in the pun-making line, past fifty years of age and five feet nine. But as he trod to grandeur's pinnacle, with eagle eye and step that never faltered, the busy tongue of scandal dared to tell that cash was scarce with him and credit altered, and while he stood the envy of beholders, the bank directors grinned and shrugged their shoulders and when these the lord burleys of the minute shake their sage heads and look demure and holy depend upon it there is something in it for whether born of wisdom or of folly suspicion is a being whose fell power blights everything it touches fruit and flower some friends they were his creditors once hinted about retrenchment and the day of doom he thanked them as no doubt they kindly meant it and made this speech when they had left the room of all the curses upon mortal scent one's creditors are the most impudent now i am one who knows what he is doing and suits exactly to his means his ends how can a man be in the path to ruin when all the brokers are his bosom friends yet on my hopes and those of my dear daughter these rascals throw a bucket of cold water. They wrinkle with deep cares the prettiest face, pour gall and wormwood in the sweetest cup, poison the very wells of life, and place Whitechapel needles with their sharp points up, even in the softest feather bed that ever was manufactured by upholsterer. This said, he journeyed at his own sweet will, like one of Wordsworth's rivers calmly on but yet at times reflection in her still small voice would whisper something must be done he asked advice of fanny 
and the maid promptly and duteously lent her aid she told him with that readiness of mind and quickness of perception which belong exclusively to gentle womankind that to submit to slanderers was wrong and the best plan to silence and admonish them would be to give a party and astonish them the hint was taken and the party given and fanny as i said some pages since was there in power and loveliness that even and he her sire demeaned him like a prince and all was joy it looked a festival where pain might smooth his brow and grief her smiles recall but fortune like some others of her sex delights in tantalizing and tormenting one day we feed upon their smiles the next is spent in swearing sorrowing and repenting if in the last four lines the author lies he's always ready to apologize eve never walked in paradise more pure than on that morn when satan played the devil with her and all her race a lovesick wooer never asked a kinder maiden or more civil than cleopatra was to antony the day she left him on the ionian sea the serpent loveliest in his coiled ring with eye that charms and beauty that outvies the tints of the rainbow bears upon his sting the deadliest venom ere the dolphin dies its youth are brightest like an infant's breath are tropic winds before the voice of death is heard upon the waters summoning the midnight earthquake from its sleep of years to do its task of woe the clouds that fling the lightning brighten ere the bolt appears the pantings of the warrior's heart are proud upon that battle morn whose night dews wet his shroud the sun is loveliest as he sinks to rest the leaves of autumn smile when fading fast the swan's last song is sweetest and the best of make's speeches doubtless was his last and thus the happiest scene in these my rhymes closed with a crash and ushered in hard times st paul's told one and fifteen minutes after down came by accident a chandelier the mansion tottered from the floor to rafter up rose the cry of agony and fear and there was shrieking screaming bustling fluttering beyond the power of writing or of uttering the company departed and neglected to say good-bye the father stormed and swore the fiddlers grinned the daughter looked dejected the flowers had vanished from the polished floor and both betook them to their sleepless beds with hearts and prospects broken but no heads the desolate relief of free complaining came with the morn and with it came bad weather the wind was east northeast and it was raining throughout that day which take it all together was one whose memory clings to us through life just like a suit in chancery or a wife that evening with a most important face and dreadful knock and tidings still more dreadful a notary came sad things had taken place my hero had forgot to do the needful a note amount not stated with his name on it was left unpaid in short he had stopped payment i hate your tragedies both long and short ones except tom thumb and juan's pantomime and stories woven of sorrows and misfortunes are bad enough in prose and worse in rhyme mine therefore must be brief under protest his notes remain the wise can guess the rest for two whole days they were the common talk the party and the failure and all that the theme of loungers in their morning walk porterhouse reasoning and tea-table chat the third some newer wonder came to blot them and on the fourth the meddling world forgot them anxious however something to discover i passed their house the shutters were all closed the song of knocker and of bell was over upon the steps two chimney sweeps reposed and on the door my dazzled eye beam met these cabalistic words this house to let they live now like chameleons upon air and hope and such cold unsubstantial dishes that they removed is clear 
but when or where none knew the curious reader if he wishes may ask them but in vain where grandeur dwells the marble dome the popular rumour tells but of the dwelling of the proud and poor from their own lips the world will never know when better days are gone it is secure beyond all other mysteries here below except perhaps a maiden lady's age when past the noonday of life's pilgrimage fanny twas with her name my song began tis proper and polite her name should end it if in my story of her woes or plan or moral can be traced twas not intended and if i've wronged her i can only tell her i'm sorry for it so is my bookseller i met her yesterday her eyes were wet she faintly smiled and said she had been reading the treasurer's report in the gazette mcintyre's speech and campbell's love lies bleeding she had a shawl on twas not a cashmere one and if it cost five dollars twas a dear one her father sent to albany a prayer for office told how fortune had abused him and modestly requested to be mayor the council very civilly refused him because however much they might desire it the public good it seems did not require it some evening since he took a lonely stroll along broadway scene of past joys and evils he felt that withering bitterness of soul quaintly denominated the blue devils and thought of bonaparte and belisarius pompey and colonel burr and caius marius and envying the loud playfulness and mirth of those who passed him gay in youth and hope he took at jupiter a shilling's worth of gazing through the showman's telescope sounds as of far-off bells came to his ears he fancied twas the music of the spheres he was mistaken it was no such thing twas yankee doodle played by scudder's band he muttered as he lingered listening something of freedom and our happy land then sketched as to his home he hurried fast this sentimental song his saddest and his last end of verses 142 to 175 this recording is in the public domain song from fanny from the poetical works of fitzgreen halleck read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone young thoughts have music in them love and happiness their theme and music wanders in the wind that lulls a morning dream and there are angel voices heard in childhood's frolic hours when life is but an april day of sunshine and of showers there's music in the forest leaves when summer winds are there and in the laugh of forest girls that braid their sunny hair the first wild bird that drinks the dew from violets of the spring has music in his song and in the fluttering of his wing there's music in the dash of waves when the swift bark cleaves their foam there's music heard upon her deck the mariner's song of home when moon and star beams smiling meet at midnight on the sea and there is music once a week in scudder's balcony but the music of young thoughts too soon is faint and dies away and from our morning dreams we wake to curse the coming day and childhood's frolic hours are brief and oft in after years their memory comes to chill the heart and dim the eye with tears to-day the forest leaves are green they'll wither on the morrow and the maiden's laugh be changed ere long to the widow's wail of sorrow come with the winter snows and ask where are the forest birds the answer is a silent one more eloquent than words 
the moonlight music of the waves in storms is heard no more when the living lightning mocks the wreck at midnight on the shore and the mariner's song of home has ceased his course is on the sea and music ceases when it rains in scudder's balcony end of poem this recording is in the public domain the recorder from the poetical works of fitz green halleck read for librivox.org by aaron harkey the recorder a petition by thomas castley december twentieth eighteen twenty eight on they move in perfect phalanx to the dorian mood of flutes and soft recorders milton live in settles numbers one day more pope my dear recorder you and i have floated down life's stream together and kept unharmed our friendship's tie through every change of fortune's sky her pleasant and her rainy weather full sixty times since first we met our birthday suns have risen and set and time has worn the baldness now of julius caesar on your brow your brow like his a field of thought with broad deep furrows spirit wrought whose laurel harvests long have shown as green and glorious as his own and proudly would the caesar claim companionship with riker's name his peer in forehead and in fame both eloquent and learned and brave born to command and skilled to rule one made the citizen a slave the other makes him more a fool the caesar an imperial crown his slave's mad gift refused to wear the riker put his fool's cap on and found it fitted to a hair the caesar though by birth and breeding travel the ladies and light reading a gentleman in mien and mind and fond of romans and their mothers was heartless as the arabs wind and slew some millions of mankind including enemies and others the riker like bob acres stood edgewise upon a field of blood the where and wherefore swartwout knows pulled trigger as a brave man should and shot god bless them his own toes the caesar passed the rubicon with helm and shield and breastplate on dashing his warhorse through the waters the riker would have built a barge or steamboat at the city's charge and passed it with his wife and daughters but let that pass as i have said there's naught save laurels on your head and time has changed my clustering hair and showered the snowflakes thickly there and though our lives have ever been as different as their different scene mine more renowned for rhymes than riches yours less for scholarship than speeches mine passed in low-roofed leafy bower yours in high halls of pomp and power yet are we be the moral told alike in one thing growing old ripened like summer's cradled chief faded like autumn's falling leaf and nearing sail and signal spread the quiet anchorage of the dead for such is human life wherever the voyage of its bark may be on home's green banked and gentle river or the world's shoreless sleepless sea yes you have floated down the tide of time a swan in grace and pride and majesty and beauty till the law the aerial of your will powers best beloved the law of libel a bright link in the legal chain expounded settled and made plain by your own charge the juror's bible has clipped the venomed tongue of slander that dared to call you party's gander the leader of the geese who make our cities parks and ponds their home and keep her liberties awake by cackling as their sires saved rome gander of party's pond wherein lizard and toad and terrapin your alehouse patriots are seen in faction's feverish sunshine basking and now to rend this veil of lies word woven by your enemies and keep your sainted memory free from tarnish with posterity i take the liberty of asking permission sir to write your life with all its scenes of calm and strife and all its turnings and its windings
A poem in a quarto volume, verse like the subject, blank and solemn, with elegant appropriate bindings of rat and moleskin the one half, the other a part fox, part calf. Your portrait graven line for line from that immortal bust and plaster, the masterpiece of art's great master, Mr. Praxiteles Brower, whose trowel is a thing divine, shall smile and bow and promise there, and twenty-nine fine forms and faces, the corporation and the mayor, linked hand in hand like loves and graces, shall hover o'er it grouped in air with wild pictorial dance and song, the song of happy bees and bowers, the dance of Guido's graceful hours, all scattering Flushing's garden flowers round the dear head they've loved so long. I know that you are modest, know that when you hear your merits praise, your cheek's quick blushes come and go, lily and rose-leaf, sun and snow, like maidens on their bridal days. I know that you would fain decline to aid me and the sacred nine, in giving to the asking earth the story of your wit and worth. For if there be a fault to cloud the brightness of your clear good sense, it is and be the fact allowed your only failing diffidence. An amiable weakness given to justify the sad reflection that in this veil of tears not even a riker is complete perfection, a most romantic detestation of power and place of pay and ration, a strange unwillingness to carry the weight of honor on your shoulders, for which you have been named the very sensitive plant of office holders, a shrinking bashfulness whose grace gives beauty to your manly face, thus shades the green and growing vine, the rough bark of the mountain pine, thus round her freedom's waking steel, harmodious wreathed his country's myrtle, and thus the golden lemon's peel gives fragrance to a bowl of turtle. True, many a flower, the poet sings, is born to blush unseen. But you, although you blush, are not the flower the poets mean. In vain you wooed a lowlier lot, in vain you clipped your eagle wings. Talents like yours are not forgot, and buried with earth's common things. No, my dear Riker, I would give, my laurels living and to live, or as much cash as you could raise on, their value by hypothecation. To be, for one enchanted hour, in beauty, majesty, and power, what you for forty years have been, the Oberon of life's fairy scene. An anxious city sought and found you, in a blessed day of joy and pride, sceptered your jeweled hand and crowned you, her chief, her guardian, and her guide. Honors which weaker minds had wrought, in vain for years and knelt and prayed for, are all your own unpriced, unbought, or, which is the same thing, unpaid for. Painfully great, against your will, her hundred offices to hold, each chair with dignity to fill, and your own pockets with her gold. A sort of double duty making, your task a serious undertaking. With what delight the eyes of all gaze on you seated in your hall. Like Sancho in his island reigning, loved leader of its motley hosts, of lawyers and their bills of costs, and all things thereto appertaining, such as crimes, constables, and juries, male pilferers and female furies, the police and the policans, illegal right and legal wrong, bribes, perjuries, lawcraft and cunning, judicial drollery and punning, and all the etceteras that grace that genteel gentlemanly place or in the council chamber standing, with eloquence of eye and brow, your voice the music of commanding, and fascination in your bow. Arranging for the civic shows, your men in buckram as per list, your John Doe's and your Richard Rose, those dummies of your games of whist. The council chamber, where authority, consists in two words, a majority, for whose contractors' jobs we pay our last year sixpences for taxes, as freely as in Scylla's day, Rome bled beneath his lictor's axes. Where, on each magisterial nose, in colors of the rainbow linger, like sunset hues on alpine snows, the print marks of your thumb and finger. Where he, the wisest of wild fowl, bird of Jove's blue-eyed maid, the owl, 
That feathered alderman is heard nightly by poet's ear alone, to other eyes and ears unknown, cheering your every look and word. And making room and gallery through, the loud applauding echoes peal of his upu en naître mieux cuation de sa famille. Oh, for a herald skill to rank your titles in their due degrees, at Sing Sing at the tradesmen's bank, in courts, committees, caucuses, at Albany, where those who knew the last year's secrets of the great call you the golden handle to the earthen pitcher of the state. Poor pitcher, that Van Buren ceases, to want its service gives me pain, t'will break into as many pieces as kitties of the Coleraine. At Bellevue on her banquet night, where Burgundy and business meet, on others at the heart's delight, the pewter mug and Frankfurt Street. From Harlem Bridge to Whitehall Dock, from Bloomingdale to Blackwell's Isles, forming, including road and rock, a city of some twelve square miles. Or street and alley, square and block, towers, temples, telegraphs, and tiles, or wharves whose stone and timbers mock the oceans and its navy shock, or all the fleets that float before her, or all their banners waving o'er her, her sky and waters, earth and air, you are lord, for who is her lord mayor? Where is he? Echo answers where, and voices like the sound of seas, breathe in sad chorus on the breeze, the highland mourner's melody. O hone awry, O hone awry, the hymn o'er happy days departed, the hope that such again may be, when power was large and liberal-hearted, and wealth was hospitality. One more request, and I am lost, if you its earnest prayer deny, it is that you preserve the most inviolable secrecy. As to my plan, our fourteen wards contain some thirty-seven bards, who, if my glorious theme were known, would make it, thought and word, their own. My hopes and happiness destroy, and trample with a rival's joy, upon the grave of my renown. My younger brothers in the art, whose study is the human heart, minstrels before whose spells have bowed, the learned, the lovely, and the proud. Ere their life's morning hours are gone, light hearts be theirs, the muses boon, and may their suns blaze bright at noon, and set without a cloud. Hill House, whose music, like his themes, lifts earth to heaven, whose poet dreams, are pure and holy as the hymn, echoed from harps of seraphim, by bards that drank at Zion's fountains, when glory, peace, and hope were hers, and beautiful upon her mountains the feet of angel messengers. Bryant, whose songs are thoughts that bless the heart, its teachers, and its joy, as mothers blend with their caress lessons of truth and gentleness and virtue for the listening boy. Spring's lovelier flowers for many a day have blossomed on his wandering way, Beings of beauty and decay, they slumber in their autumn tomb, but those that graced his own green river and wreathed the lattice of his home, charmed by his song from mortal doom, bloom on and will bloom on forever. And Halleck, who has made thy roof, St. Tammany, oblivion proof, thy beer illustrious, and thee, a belted knight of chivalry. And change thy dome of painted bricks and porter casks and politics into a green Arcadian vale with Stephen Allen for its lark, Ben Bailey's voice its watchdog's bark, and John Targee its nightingale. These and the other thirty four will live a thousand years or more, if the world lasts so long. For me, I rhyme not for posterity, though pleasant to my heirs might be the incense of its praise, when I, their ancestor, have gone and paid the debt the only one a poet ever pays. But many are my years and few, are left me ere night's holy dew, and sorrow's holier tears will keep the grass green where in death I sleep. And when that grass is green above me, and those who bless me now and love me are sleeping by my side, will it avail me aught that men Tell to the world with lip and pen that once I lived and died? No, if a garland for my brow is growing, let me have it now, while I'm alive to wear it. 
And if, in whispering my name, there's music in the voice of fame, like Garcia's, let me hear it. The Christmas holidays are nigh, therefore, till New Year's Eve, goodbye. Then réunons za nos montants. Yourself and aldermen, meanwhile, look o'er this letter with a smile, and keep the secret of its song as faithfully, but not as long. As you have guarded from the eyes of editorial Paul Prize and other meddling, murmuring claimants, those Eleusinian mysteries, the city's cash receipts and payments. Yours ever, T.C. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Walter Brown, Esquire, from the poetical works of Fitz Green Harlock, read for LibriVox.org by Inco. To Walter Brown, Esquire, member of the Council of Appointment of the State of New York at Albany, 1821. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. I cannot but remember such things were, and were most precious to me. Macbeth. We do not blame you, Walter Brown for a variety of reasons, you are now the talk of half the town, a man of talent and renown, and will be for perhaps two seasons. That face of yours has magic in it, its smile transports us in a minute, to wealth and pleasure's sunny bowers, and there is terror in its frown, which, like a mower's scythe, cuts down our city's loveliest flowers. We therefore do not blame you, sir, whate'er our cause of grief may be, and cause enough we have to stir, the very stones to mutiny, you've driven from the cash and cares of office, heedless of our prayers, men who have been for many a year to us and to our purses dear, and will be to our heirs for ever. Our tears, thanks to the snow and rain, have swelled the brook in Maiden Lane into a mountain river, and when you visit us again, leaning at Tarmony on your cane, like warrior on his battle blade, you'll mourn the havoc you have made. There is a silence and a sadness within the marble mansion now. Some of wild eyes that threaten madness. Some think of kicking up a row. Judge Miller will not yet believe that you have ventured to bereave the city and its hall of him. He has in his own fine way stated the fact must be substantiated before he'll move a single limb. He deems it cursed hard to yield the laurel won in every field through sixteen years of party war and to be seen at noon no more, enjoying at his office door the luxury of a tenth cigar. Judge Warner says that, when he's gone, you'll miss the true dogberry breed, and Christian swears that you have done a most unchristian deed. How could you have the heart to strike, from place the peerless Pierre Van Wyck, and the twin colonels, Haynes and Pell, Squire Fessenden and Sheriff Bell, Morel, a justice and a wise one, and Ed Laughlin, the exciseman, the two health officers, believers, and Clinton and contagious fevers, the keeper of the city's treasures, the sealer of her weights and measures, the harbour master, her best bower, cable in party stormy hour, ten auctioneers, three bank directors, and Mott and Duffy, the inspectors, of whisky and of flour. It was but yesterday they stood, all ex officio, great and good, that by the tomahawk struck down, of party and of Walter Brown. Where are they now, with shapes of air, the caravan of things that were, journeying to their nameless home, like Mecca's pilgrims from her tomb, with the lost Pleiad, with the wars, of Agamemnon's ancestors, with their own years of joy and grief, spring's bud and autumn's faded leaf, with birds that round their cradles flew, with winds that in their boyhood blew, last night's dream and last night's do. Yes, they are gone. Alas, each one of them. Departed, every mother's son of them. Yet often, at the close of day, when thoughts are winged and wandering, they come with the memory of the past, like sunset clouds along the mind, reflecting as they're flitting fast, in their wild hues of shade and light, all that was beautiful and bright, in golden moments left behind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Unknown from the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Karma Emmings. Dear Unknown, I am writing not to you but at you, for the feet of you tourists have no resting place, but wherever with this the male pigeon may catch you, may she find you with gaiety smile on your face. Whether chasing a snipe at the falls of Cohoes, or chased by the snakes upon Anthony's nose, whether wandering at Catskill from hotel to clove, or making sketches or speeches, puns, poems, or love, or in old Saratoga's unknown fountain land, threading groves of enchantment, half bushes, half sand, whether dancing on Sundays at Lebanon Springs, or with those Madame Hutons of religion, the Shakers, or on Tuesdays with maidens who seek wedding rings, at Boston's as taught by mamas and matchmakers, whether sailing St. Lawrence with unbroken neck, from her thousand green isles to her castled Quebec, or sketching Niagara, pencil on knee, the giant of waters, our country's pet lion, or dipped at Long Branch in the real salt sea, with a cork for a dolphin, a cockney Aryan, whether roaming earth, ocean, or even the air, like Dan O'Rourke's eagle, good luck to you there. For myself, as you'll see by the date of my letter, I am in town, but of that fact the least said the better, for it is vain to deny, though the city o'erflows, with well-dressed men and women whom nobody knows, though one rarely sees persons whose nod is an honor, a lady with fashion's own impress upon her, or a gentleman blessed with the courage to say, like Morris, the Prince Regent's friend, in his day, let others in sweet shady solitudes dwell. Oh, give me the sweet shady sides of Pall Mall. Apropos, our friend A chanced this morning to meet the accomplished Miss B as he passed Contweet's garden. Both in town in July he crossed over the street, and she entered the rouge shop of Mrs. St. Martin, resolved not to look at another known face. Through Leonard and Church streets she walked to Park Place, and he turned from Broadway into Catherine Lane, and coursed to avoid her through alley and by street, till they met as the devil would have it again, face to face near the pump at the corner of Day Street. Yet, as most of the fashion are journeying now, with the brown hues of summer on cheek and on brow, the few gens comme il faut who are lingering here are like fruits out of season, more welcome and dear. Like the last rose of summer left blooming alone, or the last snows of winter pure ice of Hauton, unmelted, undimmed by the sun's brightest ray, and like diamonds making night's darkness seem day. One meets them in groups, that Canova might fancy, at our new lounge at evening, the Opera Francais. In nines like the Muses, in three like the Graces, green spots in a desert of commonplace faces, the Queen, Mrs. Adams, goes there sweetly dressed, in a beautiful bonnet, all golden and flowery, while the King, Mr. Bonaparte, smiles on Celeste, Halua and Hutin, from his box of the Bowery. For news, Perry the North Sea is exploring, and the Grand Turk has taken, they say, the Acropolis and we in Swamp Place have discovered in Boring a mineral spring to refine the metropolis. The day we discovered it was, by the way, in the life of the Cockneys a glorious day, for we all had been taught by tradition and reading that to gain what admits us to levees of kings, the gentleness, courtesy, grace of high breeding, the only sure way was to visit the springs. So the whole town visited Swamp Spring en masse, from attorney to sweep, from physician to paver, to drink of cold water at six pence a glass, and learned true politeness and genteel behavior. Though the crowd was immense till the hour of departure, no gentleman's feelings were hurt in the rush, save a grocer's who lost his proof glass and bung starter, and a chimney sweep's robbed of his scraper and brush. They lingered till sunset and twilight had come, when, wearied in limb but much polished in manners, the sovereign people moved gracefully home in the beauty and pride of an army with banners. As to politics, Adams and Clinton get live, and reign, we presume, as we never have missed them, and Woolens and Webster continue to thrive under something they call the American system. If you're anxious to know what the country is doing, whether ruined already or going to ruin, and who her next president will be, please heaven, read the letters of Jackson, the speeches of Clay, all the party newspapers, three columns a day, and Blunt's annual register, year 27. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A fragment from the poetical works of Fitz Green Horlock, read for LibriVox.org by Inkel. A fragment. His shop is a grocer's, a snug, genteel place, near the corner of Oak Street and Pearl. He can dress, dance, and bow to the ladies with grace, and ties his cravat with a curl. He's asked to all parties, north, south, east, and west, that take place between Chatham and Cherry. And when he's been absent, full oft has the best society ceased to be merry and nothing is dark and the sky so serene 
nor disordered his bowship's Elysium, till this season among other elite there has been, what is called by the clergy, a schism. Tis all about eating and drinking, one set, give sponge cake a few kisses or so, and has cooled after dancing with classic sherbet. Sublimed, see Lord Byron, with snow. Another insists upon punch and perdie, lobster salad, champagne, and, by way, of a novelty only, those pearls of our sea, stewed oysters from Lynn Haven Bay. Miss Flounce, the young milliner, blue-eyed and bright, in the front parlour over her shop, entertains, as the phrase is, a party to-night, upon peanuts and ginger pop. And Miss Fleece, who's a hosier and not quite as young, but is wealthier far than Miss Flounce, she entertains also to-night with cold tongue, smoked herring, and cherry bounce. In praise of cold water the Theban bard spoke, he of Teos sang sweetly of wine, Miss Flounce as a pindar in cashmere and cloak, Miss Fleece, an anacreon divine. The Montagues carry the day in swamp place, in Pike Street the Capulets reign, Le Mondier is the badge of one race, of the other a flask of champagne. Now with each the same evening her soiree announces, what better, he asks, can be done, than drink water from eight until ten with the flounces, and then wine with the fleeces till one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Miss Unknown from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Halleck. Read for LibriVox.org by Karma Emmings. Air to ladies' eyes around, boy. More. The winds of March are humming, their parting song, their parting song, and summer skies are coming, and days grow long, and days grow long. I watch, but not in gladness, our garden tree, our garden tree. It buds in sober sadness, too soon for me, too soon for me. My second winter's over. Alas, and I, alas, and I have no accepted lover. Don't ask me why, don't ask me why. Tis not asleep or idle that love has been, that love has been. For many a happy bridal the year has seen, the year has seen. I've done a bridesmaid's duty, at three or four, at three or four, my best bouquet had beauty, its donor more, its donor more. My second winter's over, alas, and I, alas, and I have no accepted lover, don't ask me why, don't ask me why. His flowers my bosom shaded, one sunny day, one sunny day, the next they fled and faded, bow and bouquet, bow and bouquet. In vain at balls and parties, I've thrown my net, I've thrown my net, this waltzing watching heart is unchosen yet, unchosen yet. My second winter's over, alas and I, alas and I, have no accepted lover, don't ask me why, don't ask me why. They tell me there's no hurry, for hymen's ring, for hymen's ring, and I'm too young to marry, tis no such thing, tis no such thing. The next spring tides will dash on, my eighteenth year, my eighteenth year, it puts me in a passion, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. My second winter's over, alas and I, alas and I, have no accepted lover, don't ask me why, don't ask me why. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song for the Drama of a Spy From the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee The harp of love, when first I heard its song beneath the moonlight tree, was echoed by his plighted word and ah how dear its song to me but wailed the hour will ever be when to the air the bugle gave to hush love's gentle minstrelsy the wild war music of the brave for he hath heard its song and now its voice is sweeter than mine own and he hath broke the plighted vow he breathed to me and love alone that harp hath lost its wonted tone no more its strings his fingers move oh would that he had only known the music of the harp of love eighteen twenty two and of poem this recording is in the public domain Address at the Opening of a New Theatre From the Poetical Works of Fitz Green Horlock Read for Brox.org by Inkel Address at the Opening of a New Theatre 
November 1831. Where dwells the drama spirit, not alone, beneath the palace roof, beside the throne, in learning's cloisters, friendship's festal bowers, art's pictured halls, or triumph's laurel towers, where a man's pulses beat or passions play, she joys to smile or sigh his thoughts away, crowd times and scenes within her ring of power, and teach a life's experience in an hour. Tonight she greets for the first time our dome, her latest may it prove her lasting home, and we her messengers delighted stand, the summoned aerials of her mystic wand, to ask your welcome, bid yours to give, blister her coming hours, and bid her live. Within these walls, new hallowed in her cause, long in the nurturing warmth of your applause. Tis in the public smiles, the public loves, his dearest home, the actor breathes and moves. Your plaudits are to us and to our art, as is the lifeblood to the human heart, and every power that bids the leaf be green, in nature acts on this her mimic scene. Our sunbeams are the sparklings of glad eyes, our winds the whisper of applause that flies. From lip to lip, the heart-born laugh of glee, and sounds of cordial hands that ring out merrily, and heaven's own dew falls on us in the tear. That woman weeps o'er sorrows pictured here, and crowded feelings have no words to tell, the might, the magic of the actor's spell. These have been ours, and do we hope in vain, here often deep to feel them ours again? No, while the weary heart can find repose from its own pains in fictions, joys, or woes, whether are open lips and dimpled cheeks, where music breathes or wit or humour speaks, while Shakespeare's master spirit can call up noblest and worthiest thoughts and brim the cup of life with bubbles bright as happiness, cheating the willing bosom into bliss. So long will those who, in their spring of youth, have listened to the drama's voice of truth, marked in her scenes the manners of their age, and gathered knowledge for a wider stage, come here to speed with smiles life's summer years, and melt its winter snow with pleasant tears, in younger hearts when ours are hushed and cold, be happy here as we have been of old. Friends of the stage who hail it as the shrine, where music, painting, poetry entwine, their kindred garlands, whence their blended power, refines, exalts, ennobles hour by hour, the spirit of the land, and, like the wind, unseen but felt, bears on the bark of mind. To you the hour that consecrates this dome, will call up dreams of prouder hours to come, when some creating poet, born your own, may wake and hear the drama's loftiest tone, through after years to echo loud and long, a Shakespeare of the West, a star of song, brightening your own blue skies with living fire, all times to gladden and all tongues inspire, far as beneath the heaven by sea winds fanned, floats the free banner of your native land. End of poem, this recording is in the public domain. The Rhyme of the Ancient Coaster From the Poetical Works of Fitzgreen Halleck Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Written while sailing in an open boat on the Hudson River Between Stony Point and the Highlands On seeing the wreck of an old sloop June 1821 and this our life, exempt from public haunt, Finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, Sermons in stones, and good in everything. Shakespeare Her side is in the water, her keel is in the sand, And her bowsprit rests on the low grey rock That bounds the sea and land. Her deck is without a mast, and sand and shells are there, and the teeth of decay are gnawing her planks in the sun and the sultry air. No more on the river's bosom, when sky and wave are calm, and the clouds are in summer quietness, and the cool night breath is balm, will she glide in the swan-like stillness of the moon in the blue above a messenger from other lands, a beacon to hope and love. No more in the midnight tempest will she mock the mounting sea, strong in her oaken timbers and her white sails' bravery.
she hath borne in days departed warm hearts upon her deck those hearts like her are mouldering now the victims and the wreck of time whose touch erases each vestige of all we love the wanderers home returning who gazed that deck above and they who stood to welcome their loved ones on that shore are gone and the place that knew them shall know them never more it was a night of terror in the autumn equinox when that gallant vessel found a grave upon the peepskill rocks captain mate cook and seaman they were in all but three were saved by swimming fast and well and their gallows destiny but two a youth and maiden were left to brave the storm with unpronounceable dutch names and hearts with true love warm and they for love has watchers in air on earth and sea were saved by clinging to the wreck and their marriage destiny from sunset to night's noon she had leaned upon his arm nor heard the far-off thunder toll the toxin of alarm not so the youth he listened to the cloud-wing flapping by and lo he whispered in low dutch it tells our doom is nigh death is the lot of mortals but we are young and strong and hope not boldly for a life of happy years and long yet tis a thought consoling that till our latest breath we loved in life and shall not be divided in our death alas for those that wait us on their couch of dreams at home the morn will hear the funeral cry around their daughter's tomb they hoped twas a strange moment in dutch to quote shakespeare thy bride-bed too have deck sweet maid and not have strewn thy bier but sweetly voiced and smiling the trusting maiden said breathe not my lips the vow to-day to-morrow we will wed and i who have known thy truth through years of joy and sorrow can i believe the fickle winds no we shall wed to-morrow the tempest heard and paused the wild sea gentler moved they felt the power of woman's faith in the word of him she loved all night to rope and spar they clung with strength untired till the dark clouds fled before the sun and the fierce storm expired at noon the song of bridal bells o'er hill and valley rang at eve he called the maiden his before the holy man they dwelt beside the waters that bathe yon fallen pine and round them grew their sons and daughters like wild grapes on the vine and years and years flew o'er them like birds with beauty on their wings and theirs were happy sleigh-ride winters and long and lovely springs such joys as thrilled the lips that kissed the wave rock cooled from horeb's fountains and sorrows fleeting as the mist of morning spread upon the mountains till in good old age their life-breath passed away their name is on the churchyard page their story in my lay and let them rest together the maid the boat the boy why sing of matrimony now in this brief hour of joy our time may come and let it tis enough for us now to know that our bark will reach west point ere long if the breeze keep on to blow we have Huddybrass and milton wines flutes and a bugle horn and a dozen cigars are lingering yet of the thousand of yester morn they have gone like life's first pleasures 
and faded in smoke away and the few that are left are like bosom friends in the evening of our day we are far from the mount of battle where the wreck first met mine eye and now where twin forts in the olden time rose through the race like a swift steed our little bark goes and our bugle notes echo through anthony's nose so wrecks and rhymes good-bye end of poem this recording is in the public domain lines to her who can understand them from the poetical works of Fitzgreen Horlock, read for LibriVox.org by Inkle. Lines to her who can understand them. Air, to ladies' eyes around, boy. The song that o'er me hovered, in summer's hour, in summer's hour, today with joy has covered, my winter's bower, my winter's bower. Blessed be the lips that breathe it, as mine have been, as mine have been, when pressed in dreams beneath it, to hers unseen to hers unseen and may her heart wherever its hope may be its hope may be beat happily though never to beat for me to beat for me is she a spirit given when hour to earth when hour to earth bring me dreams from heaven her place of birth her place of birth or minstrel maiden hidden like cloistered nun like cloistered nun a bird a flower forbidden to air and sun, to air and sun, but had a power to summon, with harp divine, with harp divine, the angel or the woman, the last were mine, the last were mine. If earth-born beauty's fingers awaked the lay, awaked the lay, whose echoed music lingers round my way, round my way, where smiles the hearth she blesses, with voice and eye, with voice and eye, or binds the night her tresses, when sleep is nigh, when sleep is nigh, this fashion's bleak cold mountain, her bosom's throne, her bosom's throne, or love's green veil and fountain, with one alone, with one alone. Why ask, why seek a treasure, like her I sing, like her I sing, her name nor pain nor pleasure, to me should bring, to me should bring, love must not grieve or gladden, my thoughts of snow, my thoughts of snow, no woman soothe or sadden, my path below, my path below, but for a worldlier altar, I've knelt too long, I've knelt too long, and if my footsteps falter, tis but in song, tis but in song, nor would I break the vision, young fancy's frame, young fancy's frame, that lights with stars Elysian, a poet's name, a poet's name, but she whose gentle spirit, such dreams sublime, such dreams sublime gifts use they do not merit to sons of rhyme to sons of rhyme but place the proudest near her whate'er their pen whate'er their pen she'll say be mute to hear her mere mortal men mere mortal men yet though unseen unseeing we meet and part we meet and part be still my worshipped being in mind and heart in mind and heart and bid thy song that found me my minstrel maid, my minstrel maid, be winter sunbeam round me, and summer's shade, and summer's shade. I could not gaze upon thee, and dare thy spell, and dare thy spell, and when a happier won thee, thus bid farewell, thus bid farewell. 1832 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Extracts from an unpublished poem from the poetical works of Fitz Green Horlock, read for LibriVox.org by Inko. They burnt their last witch in Connecticut about a century and a half ago. They made a schoolhouse of her forfeit hut and gave pitying sweet briar leave to grow above her thankless ashes and they put a certified description of the show between two weeping willows craped with black on the last page of that year's almanac. Some warning and well-meant remarks were made upon the subject by the weekly printers. The people murmured at the taxes laid to pay for jurymen and the pitch-pine splinters, and the sad story made the rose-leaf fade 
upon young listeners' cheeks for several winters, when they told at fireside eaves by those who saw, executed, the lady and the law. She in the law found rest, years rose and set, that generation, cottagers and kings, slept with their fathers, and the violet has mourned above their graves a hundred springs. Few persons keep a file of the gazette, and almanacs are sublunary things, so that her fame is almost lost to earth, as if she ne'er had breathed, and of her birth, and death, and lonely life's mysterious matters, and how she played in our forefathers' times, the very devil with her sons and daughters, and how those delicate aerials of her crimes, the spirits of the rocks and woods and waters, obeyed her bidding when, in charmed rhymes, she muttered, at deep midnight, spells whose power woke from brief dream of dew the sleeping summer flower, and hushed the night bird's solitary hymn, and spoke in whispers to the forest tree, till his awed branches trembled leaf and limb, and grouped her churchyard shapes of fantasy, round merry moonlight's meadow fountain's brim, and, mocking for a space the dread decree, brought back to dead cold lips the parted breath, and changed to banquet board the buyer of death. None knew, except a patient, precious few, who've read the folios of one cotton mather, a chronicler of tales more strange than true, New England's chaplain and our history's father, a second Monmouth's Geoffrey anew, Herodotus, their laurelled victor rather, for in one art he soars above them high, the Greek or Welshman does not always lie. Know ye the venerable Cotton, he was the first publisher's tourist on this station, the first who made, by libelling earth and sea, a huge book and a handsome speculation, and ours was then a land of mystery, fit theme for poetry's exaggeration, the wildest wonder of the month, and there he wandered freely like a bird or bear, and wove his forest dreams into quaint prose, our sires his heroes, where, in holy strife, they treacherously war with friends and foes, where meek religion wears the assassin's knife, and bids the desert blossom like the rose, by sprinkling earth with blood of Indian life, and rears her altars o'er the indignant bones of murdered maidens, wives, and little ones. Herod of Galilee's babe butchering deed lives not on history's blushing page alone. Our skies, it seems, have seen like victims bleed, and our own remars echoed groan for groan, the fiends of France whose cruelties decreed, those dexterous drownings in the law and roan, were at the worst but copyists, second hand, of our shrined, sainted sires, the Plymouth Pilgrim Band, or else fibs matter, kindred walls have bade, truth's moon in chorus, but believe them not, beneath the dark trees that the leth shade, be he, his folius, followers, facts, forgot, and let his perishing monument be made, of his own unsolved volumes, tis the lot, of many, may be mine, and may be Mather's, that slanderer of the memory of our fathers. And who were they, our fathers? In their veins, ran the best blood of England's gentlemen, her bravest in the strife on battle plains, her wisest in the strife of voice and pen, her holiest teaching in her holiest veins, the law that led to martyrdom, and when, on this side ocean slept their wearied sails, and their toil bells woke up our thousand hills and dales. Shamed they their fathers? asked the village spires, above the Sabbath homes of praise and prayer. Ask of their children's happy household fires, and happier harvest noons, ask summer's air, made merry by young voices when the wires of their school cages are unloosed and dare, their slanderer's breath to blight the memory that o'er their graves is growing green to see. If he has writ their annals true, if they, the Christian sponsored and the Christian nursed, clouded with crying the sunset of their day, and warmed their winters' hearts with fires accursed, and if the stain that time wears not away of guilt was on the pilgrim axe that first, our wood paths rose blessed with smiles from heaven, in charity forgot and hope to be forgiven. Forget their story's cruelty and wrong, forget their storyteller all but deem, his facts the fictions of a minstrel's song, the myths and marvels of a poet's dream, and are they not such, suddenly among, my mind's dark thoughts its boyhood's sunrise beam, breathes in spring balm and beauty o'er my page, joy, joy, my patriot wrath hath wronged the reverend sage. Welcome, young boyhood, welcome, of thy lore, the morning gathered wealth of prose and rhyme, of fruit the flower, of gold the infant ore, the roughest shuns not manhood's stormy clime, 
but love's wild ocean's winds and breakers roar while of the blossoms of the sweet springtime the bonniest and most beautiful of joy shrink from the man and cling around the boy but now like doves with healing on their wings blossom and fruit with gladdening kindness come charming to sleep my murmuring song that sings worthy dirges over mathers's tomb welcome the olive branch their message brings it bids me wish him not the mouldering doom of nameless scribes of memoirs poor scrivere dishonest chroniclers of time's small beer no the poet born at his cradle fire the muses nursed him as their burden blown and gave him as his mind grew high and higher the ducal strawberry leaves and wreathed renown alas that mightiest masters of the lyre whose pens above an eagle's heart have grown in all the proud nobility of wing should stoop to dip their points in passion's poison spring yet milton weary of his youth's young wife to her to king to church to law and true ward for divorce and discord to the knife and proudest wore his plume of darkest hue and dante when his florence in her strife robbed him of office and his temper threw amongst friends and foes a bombshell of fierce rhymes shivering their names and fames to all succeeding times and our own mathers's fire and faggot tale of conquest with her garments rolled in blood and banners blackening like a pirate's sail the mayflower's memories of the brave and good though but a brain-born dream of rain and hail and in his epic but an episode proves mournfully the strange and sad admission of much sour grape-juice in his disposition o genius powerful with thy praise or blame when art thou feigning when art thou sincere mather who banned his living friends with shame in funeral sermons blessed them on their bier and made their deathbeds beautiful with fame fame true and gracious as the widow's tear to her departed darling husband given him whom she scolded up from earth to heaven thanks for his funeral sermons they recall the sunshine smiling through his folios leaves that makes his readers as hours in bower or hall joyous as plighted hearts on bridal eves chasing like music from the soul of soul the doubt that darkens and the ill that grieves and honouring the author's heart and mind that beats to bless and toils to a noble human kind his chaplain mantle worthily to wear he fringed its sober grey with poet bays and versed the psalms of david to the air of yankee doodle for thanksgiving days thus hallowing with the earnestness of prayer and patriotic purity of praise and conscious of irreverence or wrong a manliest battle tune and merriest bridal song the good the rhine song does to german hearts or thine marseille to france fiery blood the good thy enthemed harmony imparts god save the queen to england's field and flood a home-born blessing nature's boom not arts the same heart cheering spirit warming good to us and ours where we war or woo thy words and music yankee doodle do beneath thy star as one of the thirteen land of my lay though many a battle's night thy gallant men stepped steady and serene to that war music stern and strong delight where bayonets clenched above the trampled green the sabres grappled in the ocean's fight in siege in storm on deck or rampart there they hunted the wolf danger to his lair and sought in one sweet peace and wreaths for honour's hair and with thy smiles sweet peace came woman's bringing the eden sunshine of her welcome kiss and lovers flutes and children's voices singing the maidens promised matrons perfect bliss and heart and home bells blending with their ringing thank offerings born to holier worlds than this and the proud green of glory's laurel leaves and gold the gift of peace of plenty summer sheaves End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the poetical works of Fitz Green Horlock.